Interpreter Lee, now that we have you on the panelist side, can we test your audio one more time? Captain Marinick, can you test your video and audio for me, please? Oh, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Interpreter Lee, can you test your audio, please? We moved you back into attendee view. Hello? Hi. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to keep you on the attendee view side. Okay. Um, and when we get to public comment, we will use you as needed. Okay. Sure. Uh, and then Michael Wong will be on the main side. Uh, if, if he needs me, I will do it. Just Thank let you. me know. Thank you very much. Sure. No problem. So I'm okay right now. Just stay. Yes. Okay. Um, and just keep your mute off, um, on. Can you mute on? Yes, until public comment. Sure, got it. Yeah. Planner Bisla, can you do a video and audio check for me, please? Hi, can you hear and see me? I can, thank you so much. Chair Weeks, we are good on our side if you are ready to go on your side. Great, thank you very much. So if my fellow commissioners could um, sign on, that would be great. Okay, thank you everyone. And before we start tonight, um, I'd like to uh, ask the interpreter currently. Okay, Should I go ahead? Yes, please, Chair Weeks, continue. Okay. I'd like to ask the interpreter currently to commence translation of the meeting. Live translation can be heard on the Chinese channel. To join the Chinese channel, click on the interpretation icon on your Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Chinese channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you 
can clearly hear the Chinese translation. Um, interpreter Michael, if you can go ahead and please start um, the translation on our side for the participants. Okay, so uh, am I, I am, uh, I, I'm interpreting for the uh, commentary. I mean, for the, anybody who has an opinion about this, right? Uh, Michael, I just need you um, to guide the public. Okay, I already did that. Over. Okay, okay, let, let me start. Uh, can I start right now? I, I do it again. I already did. Okay. Yeah. Can you do it on the English channel, though, please, on the channel that you're currently on? Okay, okay. Right now, right? Okay. Yes, please. 我, 我现在要求就是翻译员开始为这次语音视频会议开始翻译。如果你想加入中文频道，请点击下方图标，有一个翻译的图标。这个图标好像，呃，在那个Zoom下端的工具箱里边，好像也像一个地球的经纬线这个坐标这样的一个图标。然后呢，进去了以后再选中文。你加入
Is this the right time or no? Um, if you are going to be speaking on either of the two items that are on the agenda tonight, you do need to wait until those items are reviewed. My apologies. Okay. So I see one more hand raised. Yes. Um, uh, now it's down. Oh. So. <laughs> Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't see any okay. more hands raised. Great, thank you. So with that, I'll go ahead and close the public comment item, a non-agended item. So we'll move on to planning commissioner's reports and um, I'll read our commission statement of purpose. The planning commission is charged with carrying out the California planning and zoning laws in the city of Santa Rosa. Duties include implementation of plans, ordinances and policies relating to land use matters, assisting in writing and implementing the general plan and area plans, holding public hearings and acting on proposed changes to the zoning code, zoning map, general plan, tentative subdivision maps and undertaking special planning studies as needed. So with that, we'll move on to item 4.2, uh, subdivision and waterways advisory committee reports. Um, Commissioner Carter, do you have any info okay okay um then we'll go to um com other commissioner reports and i'm going to start off um by reading an email that we all received from jeff okrepke um who as a lot of you know uh has been elected to center as the city council for district six and he was unable to be here tonight, which would have been his last meeting with us as a commissioner. So um, I told him I would read this into the record. Uh, good morning, my fellow commissioners. Sadly, I've had multiple conflicts come up for the December 8th planning commission meeting and will be forced to miss it. Since this was to be my last commission meeting before being sworn in as a council member, I won't be able to appropriately say my thanks and goodbyes. Therefore, and please excuse the impersonal nature, I'll have to do it via this email. First, I just want to say thank you to all that I have had the immeasurable pleasure to serve with. Land use was not a subject I was deeply familiar with when I started four years ago, but you all made it a smooth transition. Having watched other councils, commissions, and boards, I will forever be grateful for the collegial and friendly manner in which our commission conducted itself. There was never grandstanding or anger, and I truly believe it led us to be more effective and efficient. To staff, you are all amazing. Your patience with us laypersons, myself in particular, is very much appreciated. I know you have heavy workloads and the public isn't always this isn't always the smoothest of interactions, but your professionalism and work product always very much valued. I don't want to drone on and on because I could write a novella of appreciation about this experience. I just want to say thank you all for this experience that I never once regretted volunteering for. As I transition to my next position, I know this likely isn't goodbye, so I'll just say see you soon. With deepest gratitude, Jeff Okrepke. So, um, I would also uh, like to just give my thanks publicly to Jeff for his four years on the commission um, and getting to know him. And I uh, have confidence that our council will be in good hands with him. And though he will be greatly missed on the commission. Um, any other comments about uh, Mr. Krepke before I move on to the other item I wanted to mention? Okay, so the other item um, is, uh, as you may be aware, on Tuesday night, the council reviewed the um, appeal on the Jane Dispensary on Sonoma Highway. Um, at that time, there were six members of the count council present. Uh, Vice Mayor Alvarez was not able to be there. Um, and it was, the appeal was denied uh, with a 4-2 vote with um, Council Member McDonald and Mayor Rogers voting to support the appeal. So I just wanted to report that to you in case you weren't aware of that. Uh, so are there any other commissioner reports? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move on to uh, department reports. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Weeks and members of the Planning Commission. Um, good evening, or I guess good afternoon still. Uh, Jessica Jones, Deputy Director. Um, so I don't have a whole lot to report, but just wanted to let you know, one, um, uh, our director, Claire Hartman, uh, is out of the office this month dealing with some family matters. Um, so I am uh, in the acting director position. So um, should you need anything on a director level, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and then on that note, um, Claire, as of this month, um, is handing over the reins of staff liaison for the Planning Commission um, to me. So I will be your contact and staff liaison uh, for the commission moving forward. So just wanted to let you know that. Uh, and that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Um, so are there, oops, sorry, are there um, any statement of abstention? excuse me, abstentions by commissioners tonight. Okay, seeing none, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, item seven, consent items. Uh, we have no consent items today, so we'll move right on to our first scheduled public hearing. Uh, it's 8.1, it's public hearing for Stone Bri Stonebridge subdivision, CEQA addendum to a previously adopted mitigated negative declaration 2220 Fulton Road, PRJ 22-022, CUP 21-104, and MAJ 21-006. This is an ex parte item, so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Commissioner Carter. I have visited the site and I have nothing further to disclose. Thank you. Commissioner Cisco. I have nothing to disclose on this item. Commissioner Holton. I have visited the site and have nothing to disclose. And Vice Chair Peterson. I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. And I also visited the site and have nothing further to disclose. So with that, we'll go ahead, we'll move on with Planner Murray, um, who'll give us our presentation. Yeah, just one second. Let's see if I can't get this right on the first try. <clears throat> Can you see it? Yes. Yay. Okay. Um, it was bound to happen at some point. <laughs> Good <laughs> afternoon, Chair Weeks and members of the Planning Commission. The project before you this afternoon is the Stonebridge subdivision map modifications. The project is located at 2220 Fulton Road. <clears throat> I thought it would be more appropriate to show you, give you a little bit of the project history before I roll into the project because I think it'll flow better. Last May, or not last May, May of 2021, <clears throat> you approved the Stonebridge subdivision, the first round. This is a repeat performance. That, that approval included an initial study or mitigated negative declaration, conditional use permit for a 105 uh, parcel small lot subdivision, um, and a tentative map um, to subdivide the parcel into 105 residential lots and three lettered parcels. One of those lettered parcels, parcel A, was designated for stormwater treatment. <clears throat> In December last year, we received applications to, to modify the, the conditional use permit and tentative map. During staff review, we just we learned or figured out that there really wasn't a process for modifying a tentative map or a condition, uh, a, well, not for a tentative map. So this is actually um, a project that will supersede the previously approved. It's a new map and a new conditional use permit. Which takes me to the actions before the Planning Commission this, this afternoon, and that is um, an addendum to the previously approved initial study, mitigated negative declaration, a conditional use permit to supersede the previously approved project, allowing 108 residential lots <clears throat> and a new tentative map, increasing the number of lots to 108 through the subdivision of parcel A, which is no longer necessary for stormwater treatment. If approved and constructed, this project will provide 10 units for uh, moderate income uh, occupants for sale units and 98 units for mar that will be for sale market rate. Here's an aerial view of the site taken from our GIS. 
you can see it's it's the it's the portion that's outlined in blue. It's bordered uh, by other residential development to the north and south. <clears throat> this uh, parcel is developed with one residential uh, unit and several outbuildings. Here's a, um, a Google view actually that shows us um, this, the same area that's noted by the red balloon and, and gives you a better idea about the um, neighborhood context here. The approved or the, the proposed map will fit in here where it extends Andre Lane from the north to the, um, the subdivision to the north through the, uh, sub, the Stone Bridge subdivision and down to the subdivision to the south. <clears throat> the general plan land use designation in this area is low density residential. That allows residential development at two to six units per acre. Um, the, the site is in a planned development area and it's a, it is a residential plan development. The project will implement several, um, several go uh, goals of the general plan. First and foremost, it will provide housing, necessary housing to the residents of Santa Rosa and um, affordable housing to the residents of Santa Rosa. It also provides a very large area, a preserve area um, with habitat for protected species. The, proposed, the, pro, the, the way the project is proposed, it's uh, within the allowable densities at 3.77 units per acre. <clears throat> the project has been reviewed again and it remains consistent with required development standards. <clears throat> the project has been reviewed in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. As I mentioned earlier, you approved a, or adopted a mitigated negative declaration in May of 2021 and there's an addendum before you this evening to update the um, to update that mitigated negative declaration for three additional residential units. <clears throat> Here's a, a picture of the revised tentative map where you can see the, that Stonebridge Preserve occupies the, the east portion and the new residential development is on the, um, the left portion or the west portion of the, the site. And here just superimposing the site plan over that with the, the green circle shows the area of change. <clears throat> and to zoom in on that, on the left side is the approved tentative map and on the right side is the proposed tentative map. And you, you can see a few of those um, parcels on the kind of the right side of the circle there um, have been kind of um, repositioned just a little bit, adjusted a little bit to help accommodate the three new parcels that are in the gray area which was parcel A. <clears throat> there are no unresolved issues. And when I wrote this presentation, there were no new public comments. Although we did receive some, we did receive an email that was uh, uploaded as private cor or as public correspondence, late correspondence from Al Petrie from the Northwest Santa Rosa Neighborhood Association. We brought up several several things. And the first, I'm gonna kind of address them a little bit out of order. And two things that he uh, mentioned, um, raised concern about was the Fulton Road reimbursement agreement and the treatment for back on landscaping along Fulton Road. The project has been conditioned. <clears throat> I believe it's conditions 33 and 93, but don't quote me on that. Um, in the DAC or the Development Advisory Committee report um, to address those two, two situations. He also um, had some questions about the Jack London Park, which was approved, and he calls it the Jack London Park. I don't think that that's the official name, but there's a park that was approved as um, part of a development several years ago to the northeast of this site. <clears throat> and lo and behold, when I reached out to some of uh, my coworkers, I found out that there's actually a meeting scheduled next week, very serendipitous, that um, I've, I've invited myself to attend just so I can get an update on that park. Um, and uh, several city staff members and departments for that matter will be involved in that discussion. <clears throat> Mr. Petrie also brought up that, um, that no there was no mailed notice to the uh, Northwest, oops, Northwest, oh, what's it called? 
Neighborhood Association. Um, <clears throat> for that, I apologize. Um, it's not a requirement in our zoning code and all noticing for the meeting was done in compliance with the zoning code. Um, I think there's a, an educational factor here to um, that I, I, I just missed the opportunity to notify them. Um, we have agreed to work on on that with, uh, you know, just raising awareness with other planners and what have you. <clears throat> I also want to point out that there was no notice of application sent on this project. Um, when the application came in, it was a modification to a very recently approved project, and it wasn't felt that it was necessary that a, a notice of application go go out because it's a uh, that was kind of missed. There was a shift in planners and and what have you, and and um, so again, no notice of application was sent out. The application came in shortly after the other project was approved, and as you've heard me say before. Um, the zoning code allows the decision makers to proceed with their action um, in spite of a defect in noticing. <clears throat> there were also some revisions done to all three res resolutions and to the development advisory committee report. I'm just gonna go, because it was confusing, I'm gonna go through, they're all relatively minor. But on the addendum to the uh, mitigated negative declaration, there is a whereas where we added the word some minor changes in addition to the previously adopted MND. And then another whereas where we, um, well, you can see the highlighted uh, changes here, um, that it would cause uh, dot, 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 modifications that would cause new or substantial more severe impacts that were not previously analyzed. Basically, they're saying, you know, the addition of three homes is not going to result in significant impacts. <clears throat> Resolution two for the conditional use permit in the title bar, um, it referenced parcel D. Parcel D should have been parcel C because parcel C is the Stonebridge Preserve. Um, and then of course, a typo I misspelt previously. And then in the last finding uh, for the CEQA, it referenced a previously noticed or um, a previously scheduled planning commission meeting. And we just updated the date to reflect the meeting this evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in resolution three of the tentative map, um, uh, paragraph, Again, we have uh, a parcel C and parcel D mix up that was corrected. Parcel C is the one that's designated for the Stonebridge Preserve. There was also some miscellaneous formatting that was corrected to try to get it onto four pages, I think so. And then uh, last on the development advisory report, condition number 13 was modified to include the language for moderate income occupants. Um, that's how the project was approved and the uh, applicant asked that that be clarified. So we did that. So with that, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the Planning Commission, by three resolutions, adopt an addendum to the previously approved Stonebridge subdivision, initial study slash mitigated negative declaration, approve a new conditional use permit for a small lot subdivision and approve the new Stonebridge subdivision tentative map comprised of 108 residential parcels, parcels A, B, and D designated for landscaping and parcel C for the Stonebridge Preserve. That concludes my presentation. And here is my contact information for people that are calling in. If you cannot see this, my name is Susie Murray. My telephone number is 707-543 Four three four eight, and my email is s m u r r a y at srcity.org. That concludes my presentation. I know the applicant is on. Um, I believe he may have some comments, but um, I'm available to answer questions as are they. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Uh, so the applicant will not be doing a presentation. No, they will not be doing a presentation, but they are available for questions. And I believe 
that Mr. Hellman would like to make some comments. Um, Peter, if you could raise your hand. <clears throat> I, I think I did, Susie. Oh, there you are. There you are. Okay, Mr. Hellman. Well, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Weeks and members of the Planning Commission and Susie, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Hellman. Uh, I'm the principal of Paramount Homes, uh, the applicant for the Stonebridge subdivision. And I think we have on the meeting here also uh, David Jacobson, uh, the landowner, uh, and Andy Bordessa, uh, the principal and civil design consultants and our civil engineers. So the three of us are here to answer any questions that uh, uh, you or Susie may wish us to field, if any. Uh, in any case, I'm going to be very, very brief. I uh, just want to say we're very grateful um, to be on tonight's agenda. It's been a long road to get here. Uh, as Susie mentioned, we're just making one small adjustment to our approved project. That is to convert the uh, former biofiltration basin that is not needed into three additional lots that conform with the other 105 lots that were previously approved. Uh, we're very pleased with Susie's presentation and are in full agreement with it. We wouldn't change a word. And uh, just have to say that uh, ourselves and our team is very proud of Stonebridge. Uh, we're one of the first, if not the first, uh, project in Santa Rosa to provide the uh, BMR units on site uh, with a for sale project. Um, and we're especially proud of the 14 acre preserve that we will be constructing, hopefully starting this spring, which will contribute to the survival of Burke's Goldfields and Sonoma Sunshine, uh, two rare and endangered plants on the Santa Rosa Plain. And with that, I'm going to be merciful and cut my presentation off and once again, thank you very much. And uh, myself, David, and Andy are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hillman. Um, before I go to the public uh, hearing on this, are there any questions of Planner Murray or Mr. Hillman? Okay, uh, seeing none, then um, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing on this item. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please select the raised hand button. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You will have three minutes. A countdown timer will appear for the convenience of, your, of the speaker as well as viewers. And please make sure to unmute yourself when you're invited to do so. Your microphone will be muted at the end of that countdown. So I see we have three hands raised. Dave Williamson, I'm going to send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Dave Williamson, you're still muted. Yes. 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 Can you hear yes. me? Good. Yes. Excuse me. We can turn that down. Yes, can I, uh, uh, what can I do for you right now? Uh, you had your hand raised Ready? for this public comment item. Okay, I've turned myself up and uh, I'm not muted now. Can you hear me? Do you okay. have any comments on this item? Oh, okay, I need to, do I have comments? Yes, I do. I, I uh, let's see here. You're trying to connect. Okay, there you go. Now, okay, you should be able to see me. Uh, hear me? We can hear you, Mr. Williamson. Please go ahead. Okay, yes. Okay, yes. We have Austin Creek Elementary with... Uh, okay, Mr. Williamson, I think you are wanting to speak on item 8.2. Yes, I, I am. Are you, okay, 
on the right first. now we are on item item 8.1 so if you could wait until item 8.2 yeah take me off i'll wait thank Problem. you very much okay so uh, have one. yes kathy galvin i see that your hands raised i'm going to send you a prompt um please unmute yourself and then state your name for the record Kathy, you're still still muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Can you please state your name for the record before you get started? My name's Kathleen Galvin, and I live in the Woodbridge development just north of this new proposed development. I attended the public meeting last time this came up, and um, I still have the same question. Is there no plan to control traffic for this? The, the Fulton Freeway is being widened to five lanes all the way down. There's no traffic control between River Road and Piner, and it's already difficult to get out of our street onto Fulton um, at traffic at busy traffic hours. We really do need another traffic light. Is that it, Ms. Galvin? That's it. Okay, thank you very much for taking your time to make the comments. Um, so are there any other uh, members of the public who would like to speak on item 8.1? Uh, yes, David Jacobson, I'm going to send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Could you please state your name for the record? David, I see that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. David, we're having issues hearing you on your end. Um, your Zoom might need to be updated. If you'd like to make a comment, please call in. The phone number is 888-475-4499. Our meeting ID is 883-2834-7211. And then press star nine and that will enable the raise your hand feature. Let me try one more time. Can you oh, hear me now? Now we can hear you. <laughs> okay, great. I apologize. It's, uh, as always, you, you click three buttons, but you really need to click four. So my apologies. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm David Jacobson. I'm one of the owners of the property. And I want to take this moment just to thank very much uh, a number of people. But before I do that, I wanted to say, um, We've, we've been working on this project for 10 years. We're very excited to build the 14 acre preserve. It'll more than double the protected area for species in that immediate area. Uh, we're also very excited that we're gonna be able to build on-site affordable housing. And of course, build the market rate housing that will provide more, more opportunity for the citizens of Santa Rosa. But <clears throat> most importantly, I wanna thank the Planning Commission for all the guidance and help you've given us. And, and lastly, in particular, I wanna thank the staff and, and specifically Susie Murray for all of her guidance and help steering our project through our approval plans. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Da Jacobson. Uh, anybody else wanting to speak on this item? Chair Weeks, I don't see any other hands raised. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Um, before we move the resolutions, I wanted to uh, address the question um, that Ms. Galvin had regarding the traffic plan. Um, if I remember, we talked about this last time we saw this item, um, but uh, if you could 
just refresh us, that would be great. So I'm going to tell you that that there's been little change since the last time that you saw it and the traffic was analyzed during um, that uh, addendum process and the, um, the additional impacts from three homes won't change any of the conditions for that. The, the traffic division, um, Rob Sprinkle and team have, um, they reviewed the project, no concerns were raised as did our um, <clears throat> engineering and development services folks. It's kind of a double dip on that review um, always. So um, there were no other concerns raised. Thank you. Uh, so with that, um, we have three resolutions on this item and I'd like to see if somebody would like to move the first resolution and then we can start discussion of the project. Commissioner Cisco. Uh, yeah, I can move a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa adopting an addendum to the Stonebridge subdivision initial study, mitigated negative declaration, state clearing house number 2020059046 for the Stonebridge subdivision map modification project located at 2220 Fulton Road, assessor's parcel number 034. Dash zero three zero dash zero seven zero file number PRJ two two dash zero two two parentheses MAJ two one dash zero zero six and CUP two one dash one zero four and I'm way for the reading of the text. Great, thank you. Is there a second? A second. Thank you. So that was moved by Commissioner Cisco, seconded by Commissioner Holton. Um, we'll discuss the project as a whole, even though there are uh, the three different resolutions. So with that, let's go ahead and start with uh, Commissioner Carter, if you have any comments and if you can make the findings. Uh, yeah, I've um, looked at the project. It has not, as reported, changed substantially since we saw it before. And I think I can make all of the findings necessary to approve the amended uh, mitigated neg deck the use permit and the subdivision map. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cisco. Um, I also can make the findings um, for the uh, addendum to the uh, mitigated negative declaration and uh, approve the project. And Commissioner Holton. Uh, I can also make all the necessary findings to uh, support the addendum to the project and just the project as a whole. Great, and Vice Chair Peterson. Uh, yes, I, I can also make all the required findings uh, to the addendum to the previously adopted mitigated negative declaration. And I also can make all the required findings. Um, and as mentioned by both Ms. Murray and Commissioner Carter, there really haven't been in any major changes. So with that, um, if you could uh, do a roll call vote uh, for that first resolution. Commissioner Carter. Aye. Commissioner Siska. Aye. Commissioner Holton. Aye. Vice Chair Peterson. Aye. Chair Weeks. Aye. So that passes with five ayes and two absences. Uh, Commissioner Duggan and Commissioner Krepke being absent. Um, and the, then the second resolution. Commissioner Cisco, can I call on you again? Yes, you can. Thank you. Um, I'll move a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa making findings and determinations and approving a conditional use permit for the Stonebridge subdivision, a small lot subdivision with 108 residential lots, parcels A, B, and D that are designated for landscaping and parcel C designated for the Stonebridge Preserve and voiding the previously approved conditional use permit for the Stonebridge subdivision, file number PRJ19-049, approved by Planning Commission Resolution number 12056, dated May 27, 2021, for the property located at 2220 Fulton Road, file number PRJ22-022, parentheses CUP21-104 and MAJ21-006 and wait for the reading of the text. Thank you. And is there a second? Oh. Thank you, Commissioner Holton. 
In uh, so that was moved by Commissioner Cisco, seconded by Commissioner Holton. Um, once again, Commissioner Carter, comments regarding this and the findings? Uh, yes, I will be able to make the necessary findings for the modification of the use permit in support of the project. Thank you. Commissioner Cisco. I also can make the required findings for the uh, modified conditional use permit. Great. Uh, Commissioner Holton. I can also make all the necessary findings for the modified conditional use permit. And on to Vice Chair Peterson. I can also make all the required findings uh, for the modified conditional use permits. Great. And I also can make all the required findings for the um, modified use permit. So with that, that was uh, moved by Commissioner Cisco, seconded by Commissioner Holton. Uh, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Carter. Aye. Commissioner Cisco. Aye. Commissioner Holton. Aye. Vice Chair Peterson. Aye. Chair Weeks. Aye. So that passes with five ayes and two absents, uh, Commissioner Duggan and Commissioner Krupke being absent. And we go on to our third and final resolution on this item. With that, I move a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa approving the Stonebridge subdivision tentative map to allow the subdivision of one parcel into 108 residential lots, parcels A, B, and D designated for landscaping, and parcel C designated for the Stonebridge Preserve, and voiding the previously approved map, city file number PRJ19-049, approved by Planning Commission Resolution number 12057, dated May 27, 2021, for the property located at 2220 Fulton Road, Assessor's Parcel Number 034-030-070, File Number PRJ22-002, parentheses CUP21-104 and MAJ21-006, and waive further reading of the text. Thank you. Uh, Second. Thank you. So that was moved again by uh, Commissioner Cisco, seconded by Commissioner Holton. Um, We'll start with uh, Commissioner Carter. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I can make all the findings necessary to approve the revised tentative map and we'll be uh, supporting the project. Thank you. And Commissioner Cisco. I can also make all the findings for the, the new tentative map resolution and we'll support the project. And Commissioner Holton. And also make all the required findings for the approved uh, changes to the map. And I also support the project. Thank you. And uh, Vice Chair Peterson. I can also make all the required findings for the tentative map. Thank you. And I also can make all the required findings for the tentative map. Uh, so with that, um, if you could call for roll call vote, please. Commissioner Carter. Aye. Commissioner Cisco, Aye. Commissioner Holton? Aye. Vice Chair Peterson? Aye. Chair Weeks? Aye. So that passes with five ayes, two absents, Commissioner Krepke and Commissioner Duggan being absent. Uh, please note this action is final unless an appeal is filed within 10 calendar days of today's action. The time limit will be extended to the following business day if the last day falls on a day that the city is closed pursuant to 20-62.030. And for information on how to submit an appeal form, please contact the project planner. And what I'd like to do now before we move on to item 8.2 is take a five minute break um, to uh, help with the uh, interpretation.
Okay, um, staff, are you ready to, to roll? Do you need to uh, call roll again after the break? Y yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Uh, let the record reflect that all board members are present with the exception of Commissioner Duggan and Commissioner O'Krupke. Great, thank you. Uh, so with that, we will move on to our second and final item tonight, item 8.2. It's a public hearing, Pura Vida Recovery Services. It's a CEQA exempt project, minor conditional use permit at 5761 Mountain Hawk, suites 201 to 207, file number CUP 22-045. This is an ex parte item. So let's go ahead and start with Commissioner Carter. Yes, I have visited the site and uh, the applicants of our operation in Santa Rosa, and I have nothing further to disclose. Thank you. Commissioner Cisco. Um, I visited the site. I also looked up our um, June 23rd, 2005 Planning Commission meeting minutes, which was when this project was approved, mainly because I wanted to refresh my memory of what our recommendations were. Didn't really learn anything new, just concerns were expressed and care was taken with regard to the scenic road designation. Um, the older minutes actually contain narrative instead of just bullet points, so it's kind of fun to go back and read them and um, they're more informative than what we get now. So anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Holton. I have nothing to disclose. And Vice Chair Peterson. I visited the site and have no additional information to disclose. Great. And uh, I also visited the site and have nothing further to disclose. Um, before we start with uh, Planner Bisla, I would like to mention that since we anticipate quite a few speakers tonight on this, we will be um, limiting public comments to two minutes each. And if you require uh, interpretation, it would be then a total of four minutes, two minutes for the English and two minutes for the Chinese. So uh, with that, um, Planner Bisla, you wanna take it off? Hello, yes, good afternoon. Um, let me share my screen. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes, we are. Great, um, so I am Planner Bisla, and this is a request for a minor conditional use permit for Pura Vida Recovery Services. It's a 24 bed community care facility for monitored, to, mon, monitored detoxification and withdrawal management slash residential treatment. It would be a 20, 24 hour operation with three to five staff members for overnight shifts and six to eight for daytime shifts. The project would be located at 5761 Mountain Hawk Drive. And as you can see here, it's on the corner of Mountain Hawk and Highway 12. Some project history for background. On July 22nd, the applicant obtained a zoning clearance for a community care facility with six or fewer clients as it is permitted in um, all zoning districts except for the motor vehicle sales district. On August 1st, a minor conditional use permit application was submitted for a community care facility with seven or more clients. On October 10th, 2022, the notice of public meeting was distributed and October 10th, the request for a public hearing was received. And finally, on October 31st, city staff met with neighbors. 
There have been some changes to the application materials since the initial notice of public meeting for the October 20th zoning administrator meeting. The applicant is no longer proposing an outpatient clinic in the downstairs suites as they're all occupied by tenants in long-term leases. Um, should the applicant wish to incorporate an outpatient clinic in the future, an additional minor use, minor conditional use permit would be required. The applicant has also proposed a designated smoking area location. The project site is a part of the neighborhood commercial zoning district, as well as the scenic road combining district. Community care facilities with seven or more clients are allowed in the neighborhood commercial zoning district through a minor conditional use permit. The general plan land use designation for this site is very low density residential. Although the zoning for this site is not consistent with the general plan land use designation, the use would still be consistent. The implementing zoning district for the very low density residential land use would be rural residential, where the proposed use would still be allowed with a minor conditional use permit. In fact, all large community care facilities are permitted in all of the city's zoning districts with a minor use permit, with the exception of the motor vehicle sales district. This proposed use is consistent with numerous goals and policies of the general plan. There are no other large community care facilities in this neighborhood. The nearest community care facility with seven or more clients is approximately two miles west of the subject site. By providing housing and treatment for people suffering from addiction, the proposed project helps to diversify Santa Rosa's housing stock to meet the needs of various residents. This here is not an exhaustive list of general plan goals and policies which the proposed use is consistent with. It's just a sample of policies pulled by staff. The minor use permit for large facilities does need to ensure general plan consistency but it is there to allow the city to analyze the specifics of the proposed facility to ensure that it meets the standards of the community care facility section of the zoning code and that it is compatible with the surrounding area, which is what the commission is being tasked with considering. Here you can see a floor plan um, of the seven suites. As you can see, the middle suite would be uh, used as an office for staff to work out of and the remaining six have two bedrooms with two beds in each bedroom. The parking requirements table in the zoning code requires one spot for every three beds for a community care facility. The project proposes 24 beds, so eight parking spots would be required. However, the business has access to 30 shared off-street parking spots. At the bottom of the site plan here, we can see the proposed location for the de designated smoking area, which meets all requirements of the smoking ordinance. This is entirely conceptual, however, and the applicant has agreed to work with the city to determine the most appropriate design and location for the designated smoking area. Planning staff is required to make six findings uh, for approval of a minor conditional use permit. Number one, um, the proposed use is allowed within the applicable zoning district and complies with all other applicable provisions of the zoning code and the city code. In this case, the property is zoned neighborhood commercial scenic road and the zoning code allows the proposed use in neighborhood commercial districts through the approval of a minor conditional use permit. Number two, the proposed use is consistent with the general plan and any applicable specific plan. Staff has found consistency with the general plan in that community care facilities are identified as a residential land use, which would be consistent with all of the general plan residential land use designations, including the, including the subject site's very low density residential land use designation. Specifically, the zoning code allows the proposed use in the rural residential zoning district, which implements the subject site's very low density residential land use designation with the approval of a minor conditional use permit. Staff has also found consistency with the general plans, goals, and policies, which I previously summarized. Number three, the design, location, size, and operating characteristics of the proposed activity would be compatible with the existing and future land uses in the vicinity. 
While the site is surrounded by single family residential development, the zoning code identifies community care facilities as a residential use. The proposed use has been conditioned to ensure that sufficient parking will be provided, that facility staff will be available 24 hours per day and clients will be supervised when outside of the facility. In addition, a hotline will be provided for neighbors and visitors in the event of a complaint or concern. Clients will be screened and no sex offenders or violent felons will be admitted to the facility and clients will be required to be sober while in the program and will be screened on a daily basis. The project is required to comply with the city's noise ordinance, which would prevent any loud, unnecessary, or unusual noise which disturbs the neighborhood. Number four, the site is physically suitable for the type, density, and intensity of the use, of the use being proposed, including access to utilities and the absence of physical constraints. Each second floor apartment is 1,188 square feet and can accommodate the proposed use. The existing facility is already connected to utilities and traffic and parking demand is not anticipated to significantly increase. Number five, granting the permit would not constitute a nuisance or be injurious or detrimental to the public interest, health, safety, convenience, or welfare, or materially injurious to the person's property or improvements in the vicinity and zoning district in which the property is located. New clients will only be admitted during business hours and are required to stay within the facility during their stay with a minimum of three to six staff members on site. Further, clients will be drug tested as well as criminally screened and the Santa Rosa Police Department has reviewed the proposal and has no concerns regarding safety. Number six, the proposed project has been reviewed in compliance with the, with the California Environmental Quality Act, which I will get to in just a second. Um, but there are two findings specific to community care facilities, which are included in the draft resolution before you. This project is categorically exempt from CEQA with three um, exemptions. Number one, it is located, um, sorry, it is exempt with a class one exemption in that it is located in an existing structure involving negligible expansion. It is also exempt with a class three exemption in that it is a change of use requiring only minor exterior modifications to the structure and class 32 as well in that it is an infill project. Staff has received numerous public comments both opposed to and in favor of the proposed project. To summarize some of the primary concerns, um, there are concerns of proximity to an elementary school and compromised safety, traffic impacts, effects on the economic vitality of neighboring businesses and issues during fire evacuation. Neighbors have expressed concern regarding proximity to, to an elementary school and compromised safety. However, no evidence has been suggested to has been submitted to suggest that the proposed neighborhood will affect the safety. Sorry, the proposed project will affect the safety of the neighborhood. State law and city code also do not limit proximity between schools and community care facilities. And the police department has reviewed the project and does not have any concern. Regarding traffic impacts, um, a trip generation memo was done by W Trans and it demonstrates that the proposed use would have a very insignificant effect on traffic. Clients will not have vehicles while they're on site and they're not allowed to leave without a staff member and client check-in will take place during business hours, so there will be no after-hours traffic to the site. Regarding effects on economic vitality of neighboring businesses, the applicant has actually received numerous letters of support from neighboring businesses of their existing locations, and the city does not have any documentation that the proposed use would have a negative impact on the neighboring businesses on site. Regarding issues during fire evacuation, the number of clients here will be similar to the number of tenants who were previously housed in the residential units, which was 22. However, um, in the case of fire evacuation with Pura Vida, clients will be evacuated in two vans, whereas previously the tenants would have each driven their own vehicles. There's also been public comment received in support of the project. To summarize, 
Incorporating the facility into a neighborhood commercial plaza would help to decrease the stigma that those trying to recover need to be isolated and institutionalized. Addiction does not discriminate based on neighborhood or socioeconomic status, making Skyhawk an appropriate location. Neighbors of current Pura Vida facilities say that they are responsible and respectful neighbors and support, and there has been support from Pura Vida program graduates and their families. Therefore, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the Planning Commission, by resolution, approve a minor conditional use permit for Pura Vida Recovery Services, a 24-bed community care facility, and void the zoning clearance previously issued on July 22, 2022, for a community care facility with six or fewer clients located at 5761 Mountain Hawk Drive, Suites 201 through 207. For any questions, comments, or concerns, um, this is my contact info. And for anybody phoning in, my name is Sachinora Bisla. My email is sbisla at srcity.org. That's S-E-I-S-L-A. And my number is 707-543-3223. Um, I believe the applicant is uh, has a presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... And before we go to the applicant, are there any questions of Planner Bisla? Okay, then uh, let's go ahead and hear from the applicant. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. And can you please state your name for the record? Yeah, my name is Alex Wignall, um, and I'm one of the owners of Pure Vita Recovery Services. Um, thank you, Nora, for your presentation. I appreciate all your work. Um, I wanted to make a presentation to um, accomplish a couple things, to address some of the concerns that we've seen from the community, um, as well as to describe sort of the day-to-day -day operations of what's going to happen in a facility, because it uh, is unfamiliar to most people how a non-medical residential detox or non-medical residential treatment program might work. Um, so I prepared a, um, a presentation that I'm just going to read through. Um, there are also a couple um, points that I'm prepared to uh, answer if they become an issue. I know that we found out late that there was some concern about our status as a non-medical facility. And I have lots of information and documentation about that in regards to our state license and our accreditation um, and how we operate uh, our business. So um, first, uh, I wanted to thank everyone who's shown support for our project. Uh, it's an affirmation that the good work we strive to do every day is making an impact and achieving its desired goal to provide quality, affordable addiction treatment to as many people as possible. Pura Vida Recovery Services was founded in 2017 by myself, David Wignall, and Ben Polivon. Um, David is my dad and the father of six children, uh, three of whom have had issues with addiction. And Ben is a friend that I met when we were both in early recovery 10 years ago. Um, I'm telling everyone these personal details to assure you that we are invested in the project. Um, it's not just a, a side business or something that we do part-time. This is, this is our life. Um, our lives have been forever changed by our experiences with addiction and recovery. Pure Vita Recovery Services is licensed and certified by the California Department of Healthcare Services and our, program, our programs are accredited by the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations. Um, in addition, we are um, credentialed with and contracted with some of the largest insurance providers in California. Um, and they also require a significant amount of oversight. They trust us with their, their clients and their patients. Um, and that requires us to meet the highest industry standards. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I wanted to point out is that um, I believe there was some question about whether we um, this facility should be considered a community care facility as opposed to a health care healthcare facility or some other designation in the city code. Um, if you look at the, the language on our license, 
which I've included in my presentation, it says that we are licensed to operate and maintain a non-medical adult residential alcohol and or drug program. Um, underneath that, you'll see several other, other designations, which we are licensed to um, provide services for. Um, let me scroll down to that really quick. Those include uh, incidental medical services, detoxification, recovery and treatment services, under the level of care designation, clinically managed low intensity residential services, clinically managed residential withdrawal management, clinically managed population specific high intensity residential services, and clinically managed high intensity residential services. Um, you'll notice on there that it does not say, other than incidental, incidental medical services, it doesn't mention medical services or inpatient services. And um, it's an important distinction if I have to reference later the health and safe, California Health and Safety Code, um, because our program is classified differently than healthcare facilities, which are outlined in the Santa Rosa Zoning Code. So I just wanted to make note of that now, and uh, I can elaborate on that later. Um, the Santa Rosa, City of Santa Rosa's definition of a community care facility is a facility, place, or building that is maintained and operated to provide non-medical residential care, which may include home finding and other services for a variety of different people, including the addicted. So as you can see, the license on our, the wording on our license matches up almost word for word with the wording in the, the city's definition of community care. Um, there's also been some confusion about the types of services we're going to provide on site, and so I wanted to clear that up. There's not going to be unsupervised sober living. Um, it's not going to be a halfway house. It's not going to be a walk-up medication clinic like a methadone clinic um, or a suboxone clinic. We're not going to be home housing the homeless, um, and we do not receive any county, state, or federal funding. Everyone who comes to our program pays either privately or through their private insurance. Um, our staff is very experienced and um, our clinical supervisor is a licensed psychologist with 10 years of experience in the field. Our program director is a certified addiction counselor with 10 plus years of experience in the field. Our counselors are all certified and registered addiction counselors. Um, that is a position that we hire entry level people at and train to, to fill the position. Um, but we have counselors that have up to 15 years of experience as well. Um, the day to day and overnight staff consists of medical assistants and trained treatment technicians. And they also can be entry level, but have up to five years of experience. Um, our nursing supervisor and safety officer is a registered nurse. Um, she's on call 24 seven in case of an emergency um, to give guidance to our, our day to day and overnight staff. Um, and she has over five years of experience in a level three trauma center in the emergency department. Um, and our medical and incidental medical services director um, is a medical doctor with 25 plus years of experience with addiction medicine. So, <clears throat> What is non-medical residential detox? It's kind of a mouthful. Um, I'm hoping I don't mess it up during my presentation too many times. The goal of detox is for clients to stop using drugs and alcohol safely. Um, a lot of times, depending on someone's history of use, it's not safe to just stop drinking at home, but you also might not need to be in a hospital. And so we fill a niche in between those two uh, situations. Um, our facility is supervised 24 hours a day. Um, our clients actually, during their first 24 hours, they're required to be physically observed and monitored every 15 minutes, which is documented and charted. Um, and they check for normal breathing, client affect, things like that. On top of that, they have their vitals checked every three hours. And we have a range of acceptable vitals for those clients if they go outside of that range. Um, they're moved to a facility where they can have medical attention. Our clients are all screened and physically searched upon entry um, and they're drug tested daily. Um, they do not have access to their personal phones or electronic devices for the first 72 hours while they're in treatment. Um, all meals are provided on site. All activities are on site. Um, 
They receive exposure to addiction treatment through group counseling and individual counseling and treatment planning. And clients at this level of care do not have vehicles on site and do not go anywhere outside of the facility um, during treatment, except for potentially mild exercise under the direct supervision of Jervita staff. Uh, clients in this level of care typically stay with us for between three and 14 days, depending on necessity. The other service that we're requesting um, permit for is to provide non-medical residential treatment, which um, is a step down in intensity from detox. So um, the goal of this level of care is to educate and deliver clinical programming to clients while in a safe, structured, sober environment to build the foundation for lasting recovery from drugs and alcohol. Typically, this is the second step someone would participate in their recovery after detox. Um, so it is, can, it's, it's probable that when this uh, permit is approved, people will move directly from detox into the residential level of care at the same facility. Um, during this level of care, clients are physically free from drugs and alcohol. They're tested regularly to ensure compliance. Um, again, they have 24 hour supervision by medical assistants, counselors, psychologists, and treatment technicians. Meals are provided on site and off site, depending on their schedule for the day. Activities and treatment are both on site and off site, depending on their schedule. Clients will be off site for a majority of the day, um, potentially from around 10 a.m. until around 6 p.m. Um, they're allowed to receive treatment at our other facility on the west side of town um, so that we will be transporting them to our other facility where they'll be meeting with the counselors and have group counseling as well. Uh, then they would arrive back and have dinner, participate in a potentially in a um, community based recovery meeting or hold a meeting in the house themselves. Um, and then they would go to bed and start all over the next day. Um, these clients also do not have vehicles or go anywhere outside without a representative, pure, representative of Pure Vita Recovery Services. They receive six to eight hours a day of treatment, which can include individual counseling. CBT, DBT, which are two forms of talk therapy, relapse prevention, recreational therapy, physical fitness, self-help meetings, spiritual practices, seeking safety, trauma-informed care, life skills, and community reintegration skills. And I've attached a sample schedule to this presentation too for anyone that wants to look at it. Clients in this level of care typically stay with us for 30 to 90 days. As recovering addicts and alcoholics, our future clients are protected by several pieces of longstanding federal and state legislation. They are guaranteed the same rights and access to housing and services as anyone else. As their representatives, we intend to make sure that they have those rights and access to quality addiction treatment. It is clear that this legislation was considered carefully by the city and the protections codified in federal and state law are also reflected in, in the city's zoning code and general plan. Uh, this legislation makes clear that um, fears and assertions based on stereotypes about our potential clients and their status as addicts cannot be acted on by the city as a justification for denying this permit. Um, I think Nora put it perfectly when she talked about, um, you know, their findings, the city's findings. Um, the police department has no issue with our proposed project. Our current neighbors love us. Um, and we've never had any issues like some of the concerns we've seen. So I'm going to go through some of the concerns that we've seen specifically just to address them. Um, the first one I want to talk about is a concern that our program will be located too close to a school, which is a bad thing because addicts seeking treatment will bother the children and or uh, are unsafe to be around them. As Nora mentioned, there's no restriction on proximity of community care facilities to schools anywhere in the zoning code. Furthermore, as a father in recovery with two young children and a third on the way, I take particular offense at this suggestion. I owe my life, my family, and everything I have to a facility like the one we are propo proposing. I bring my kids to work with me once a week. They interact with our staff and our clients. Our clients are not just drug addicts. They're loving parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, 
children, siblings, to suggest that because our clients are seeking treatment for a diagnosable behavioral health condition, they are somehow, somehow unfit to be within a half a mile of children is absurd. Our current detox facility has been located directly behind an elementary school in Santa Rosa for two years. I called the principal of that elementary school and asked her if she knew there was a six bed detox facility behind the school. She had no idea. Our clients are supervised and absolutely safe to receive treatment within any distance of children in our community. And our experience shows that you won't even notice that we're there. There's been concern that our program will lead to an influx of homeless and vagrant people in the area. Um, I think based on the structure that I described, um, you can glean that that's not going to be true. Uh, our program has a 100% voluntary admission. We don't, we don't take court order to paroled clients. No one is forced to come to treatment with us. Um, we, conduct, we conduct rigorous screenings for mental health, general health, family dynamics, criminal background. And we do these things for a couple of reasons. We only want to treat people that we're qualified to treat, first of all. And second of all, um, there are situations where people aren't a good fit for our program because of some issues that they may have, and we screen for those things. Um, there's been an assertion that this project will negatively impact the community. Um, I would argue that we're going to have the exact opposite effect. We provide a much needed service to individuals struggling with substance abuse. There's currently only one other private residential recovery program and no existing private detoxification facility in the city of Santa Rosa. And the addiction rate continues to rise. On top of that, the only residential program in city limits is an all women's program. So there are currently no male residential um, treatment beds in Santa Rosa city limits. As a result, many clients who need detoxification and residential services end up burdening our emergency department capacity as well as local hospitals and healthcare staff or worse, they don't get the help they need before it's too late. <clears throat> um, nor did a good job of addressing safe egress during a fire emergency. But I wanted to add that our license and our accreditation require that we have emergency management plans in place and our, traffic, our staff is well, well trained uh, to facilitate those types of issues. A lot of people thought that we weren't licensed or accredited. Um, and again, we're licensed by the Department of Healthcare Services and we're accredited by, accredited by the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Health Care Organizations. Um, there have been people requesting a success rate from us. Um, and I just want to make a quick word on that. Uh, any addiction treatment center that advertises a success rate is lying to you. If there was a treatment modality with a 90% success rate, we would hardly need treatment centers at all. Unfortunately, addiction is one of the most deadly and challenging diseases to treat. Attempts to determine a success rate are confounded by multiple factors. Additionally, there's the question of how to define success. Does everyone who comes to treatment need to stay sober from all substances for the rest of their lives? Does an opiate addict need to never drink a beer again? Does an alcoholic who stops drinking need to refuse pain medication after a surgery? Um, these are all questions that require a case-by-case -case analysis, and you can't just check a box in a yes, success, no, fail uh, type of category. Pure Vita does follow up with clients to gain insight into our program and get better, but we do not attempt to aggregate a success or failure rate. There's been a concern that the proposed project will have a negative effect on the businesses currently located at the address. Um, our current location in Santa Rosa has had the opposite effect on our neighbors. Our clients and staff have become regular customers with neighboring businesses. Rita has even partnered with some of these neighbors to provide routine services for our clients. We've su submitted letters of support from these neighbors which affirm these statements. We've never had any issues with vandalism, crime, or any other nuisance. There's also no evidence to suggest that an addiction treatment center negatively affects property values in the surrounding area. Uh, some people want to not want to know why we would put addiction treatment center next to a restaurant that has a bar in it. Um, you know, maybe in a perfect world we wouldn't, but in our society, it's pretty hard to find a location that's not next to somewhere that sells alcohol. 
Um, our current location was located directly next to a bar and restaurant for four years before that bar went out of business. We never had a single issue with a client going to get a drink or relapsing there, but we did have several people from the bar wander over to ask us about quitting drinking. Um, there was another issue about parking, but I, Nor did a good job on that one. Um, you know, in closing, I just, uh, my partners and I hope that we can move forward with support from the entire community. Um, but regardless of what happens, we'll continue to work tirelessly to make sure everyone who needs our help can get it. So sorry, that was a little long winded. There's a lot to get through. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I have a lot more information. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, so I guess we'll be here for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wingnall. Um, any questions of the applicants at this time? Um, I, I do want to um, just ask you about the license. So do you have a license on the current on the site on Skyhawk? And if you don't, um, what is the process and how long does that all take? I, I wasn't real clear on that. Sure. Um, right now we have a license to operate a six bed detox facility on the west side of Santa Rosa, which we currently operate. And we've submitted to add an address, um, two of the units on the end, units 201 and 202 are included in an application with the Department of Healthcare Services to add six more beds there to fulfill the zoning clearance that we got from the city um, back in, I think it was September or October. Um, as far as the timeline goes, we're still waiting. Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's taking time. They're all working remotely. Um, but that process involves a site visit, um, a re-implementation of new standards there. Uh, we have to meet the same standards as at our previous facility. Um, so we'll have to furnish it and staff it and um, fulfill all the obligations of our existing license. Um, and then we'll also have to add that facility to our accreditation, which will be another site visit from the accrediting body as well. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Cisco. I actually have a lot of questions uh, for the applicant, but do you want me to go into those now or do you want to wait till after the public hearing? They're sort of specific to the detox process. Um, Let's go ahead and wait till after the public hearing uh, portion of the meeting. Um, okay. And so if there aren't, are there any other questions at this point? Uh, we did get a request to take a quick break uh, to help with the interpreters. So if we could take like a three minute break, um, that would be great. And then when we come back, we will go right into the public hearing.
Chair Weeks, um, yep. can, we, can we get an extra two minutes? I'm just checking in with the interpreters really quickly. Sure, no problem. Just uh, give a shout when uh, you're ready to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chair Weeks, uh, we're ready to go whenever you are. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for, for that. Um, so with that, um, We'll go ahead and um, bring um, bring it back to the commission. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you need to do a roll call since we took a break? I'm never quite sure what the logistics are for it. Yes. Okay. Um, let the record reflect that all commissioners are present, with the exception exception of Commissioners Duggan and Commissioner uh, Okrupke. Great, thank you. Um, as I previously uh, stated, excuse me, I'm sorry, I don't see Vice Chair Peterson. There he is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crocker. Um, I like that you keep us on our toes. Um, so as I previously stated, due to the number of comments we anticipate tonight, um, we'll be limiting public comment on this item to two minutes. If you are, will be using um, the Chinese interpretation, would be a total of four minutes, two minutes for the English and two minutes for the Chinese. Um, if you are participating in the meeting from the Chinese channel in Zoom, we have an interpreter on standby on the English channel to assist during your public comment. If you wish to make a public comment, please make sure to pause throughout your comment to allow for interpretation. For Chinese speakers at the time you hear your name called, please turn off the Chinese channel to make your public comment. And the icon looks like a circle with a M in the middle and the word Chinese underneath. Um, so with that, I will now go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please select the raised hand button. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Each speaker, as I said, has two minutes. A countdown timer 
will appear for the convenience of the speaker and the viewers. Please make sure to unmute yourself when you're invited to do so. Your microphone will be muted at the end of the countdown. The first four speakers from the public will be as follows as they are providing a presentation. So the first speaker will be David Chen, followed by David Paul, followed by Kermit Springstead, and then Robert Butler. As a reminder, you will have two minutes each. So we will start with uh, David Chen. David Chen, I just gave you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good evening, Chair Wicks and Commissioners. My name is David Chen, a resident in Skyhawk for over 22 years. I'm a deacon board member of the Chinese Christian Church in Santa Rosa, and I'm an organizer of the Skyhawk United. We formed multiple study groups to analyze the Purita project with contributions from medical physicians substance abuse clinical psychologists, city planners, former county directors, former law enforcement officers, 911 dispatchers, teachers, firefighters, and social workers. Each of these groups has reported back that the, the facility is inappropriate for such a compromised adult facility and it has a negative impact on our community, safety, security, and prosperity. It is so close to our school, which, is, which has 350 students. And we have an alternative study group, and they have found that at least there are two other good solutions in Santa Rosa which will better serve such compromised clients. For these reasons, on behalf of the 516 residents signed the petition, I request you deny the minor conditional user permit and issue a permanent injunction for anything bigger than six bed. I thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker uh, will be David Paul. Give me a second to find him. I don't see him. Yeah, I don't see him either. Um, could we, um, could you, oh, now I see him, <laughs> sorry. I see him as the last person with their hand raised. Uh, David Paul, I just sent you a prompt. Uh, can you please state your name for the record? Good evening, Chair and members of the Santa Rosa Planning Commission, and thank you, Noor. My name is David Paul. I'm a retired management professor, and my wife and I have lived at 5683 Queen Anne Drive since March of 2017. This project is less than 400 feet from the corner of my lot and less than 600 feet from the care home that has been located right next door to me. This fact in and of itself is cause for denial of the permit because it violates the 1000 foot rule in zoning code 2042060, which defines over concentration of facilities. There is no evidence of any mit mitigation. Our research team shows that this project would violate the zoning code, the city code, and the general plan of the city of Santa Rosa. The design, the location, and the operating characteristics of this project would not be compatible with existing and future land uses in the vicinity of Skyhawk. Approving the project would put the city in violation of state law. Basically, the project does not serve any Skyhawk neighborhood needs whatever. 
this project has evicted Skyhawk residents from seven Skyhawk Village apartments and will create a for-profit detox facility and bring 24 addicts into our neighborhood. To approve this minor use permit, all the findings in 2052-50 must be made and they cannot be made. This proposed facility is not consistent with CN designation because it does not help the neighborhood. It claims it is a negligible expansion of a previous small community care facility. And as you heard from the applicant, no community care facility has ever been located at this site. And the expansion from six clients to 24 clients is dramatic, not Thank you, negligible. Mr. Paul. Thank you. Um, the next speaker will be Kermit Springstead. Kermit Springstead, I just sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? My name is Kermit Springstead. I am a resident here of Skyhawk. And first, thank you for taking my comments. I want to ask the committee to look beyond the neatly completed application and submitted plan for this project and listen to the concerns that I have as a nurse of 40 years whose practice has been centered on working with patients to both recover from their illness and return to a pre-morbid state. And for the record, I have no fear of this population. I am concerned that this plan is no more than a human warehouse being forced into a physical setting that was not designed for a therapeutic milieu. Apartments that were designed for people living independent lives with the capacity to come and go at their will were not intended to house vulnerable individuals defined by the very nature of meeting the emission criteria for this recovery program. Consider the white space that newly sober addicts experience. The white space is the empty time that those in recovery experience when there is no drug-induced stupor to keep them occupied. Being subject to housing in an isolated environment with so much white space in the evening and nighttime after the van brings you back and no structure on how to use this time concerns me as a nurse advocate for patient safety and mental well-being. The only available interaction is limited to other folks as vulnerable as they are and infrequent checks by staff also sleeping. There is no capacity for healthy plan congregate activities and socializing, nor are there any activities or services available in the strip mall other than an eatery that serves alcoholic beverages. Stuffing multiple strangers into an apartment with the expectation of their safety and security causes me great concern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Springstead. Um, the next speaker will be Robert Butler. Robert Butler, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. If you could please state your name for the record. Hello, Chair and Commission. I'm Dr. Robert Butler. I live in Skyhawk. I was born and raised in this area um, when it was Austin Ranch. In fact, um, I went to local Recon Valley schools. I also have children. I used to work at the Developmental Center in Eldridge, and most recently as a director at the County of Sonoma, working closely with social service departments and programs. From this, I have gained experience with the intended population and witnessed the effects of addiction and clutter damage it causes firsthand. There's no question this population needs access to quality treatment um, and services. However, this proposal doesn't do that. First and foremost is safety. In addition to the elementary school, the village location is very close to a children's playground and soccer fields where families and children frequent. There's a trail that runs from the apartments along the creek to these places that are not fenced and easily accessible. There's nothing physically preventing clients from wandering off. Those coming down off substances can also often be agitated, aggressive, and violent. Um, so there could be undesirable encounters between them and the public. Former clients of relapse could likely return to the area, so we need better presence from the police. Smoking creates um, a fire risk as well as secondhand smoke health risks. There are also impacts to housing, property values, and quality of life. Um, the proposal has already displaced existing tenants. The community will per permanently lose seven affordable residential housing units, um, which could affect families who want to live near excellent schools and quality education. 
Regarding property values, there are numerous studies that show that property values decrease where detox rehab facilities are established. And the quality of life, um, neighbors um, indicated that they would be fearful and um, not use the village any longer. So in conclusion, I strongly urge the commission to deny the application for more than six beds at this location. And now I turn it over to Greg Cohey as the next speaker for public comment. Thank you. Uh, no, excuse me, the next speaker, we had four speakers, um, David Chen, David Paul, okay. and yourself. So the next speaker um, will be Nancy Wong. Nancy, I sent you um, a prompt. Can you please state your name for the record? My name is Nancy Wong. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you for the uh, chair, Wakes, and the commission members. I am 45 years resident in Santa Rosa, and also I serve on the city council for 12 years for city council advisor board and North East Skyhawk is my district. I work with all the residents there. I'm holding so many town hall meetings, helping them to increase, I mean, improve the parks. Please just don't visit, visit the site. Say it's okay to have this facility. You gotta get it into the resident there to know the resident what they need. You know, first I heard this project. I think it's so dangerous, not a safety for the Skyhawk resident. Wonderful elementary school and the trail over there, the soccer field, that all the projects I did personal involved with the Skyhawk resident. And this facility is not a safe for the resident. I know a lot of people already, I don't want to double you know, the people say things, but I really asking planning commission, please do not approve this plant. 24 bed, this is another kitty. I mean, it's not a safe. Absolutely, these people go around, the, go out to the resident. Are you gonna guarantee it's not, nothing happened? You don't want to wait till Things, I mean, things happen, then you are taking care of the problem. This is not the right way. Please do not poof. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker will be Judy Chen. Judy Chen, I just sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Could you please state your name for the record? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, hi, Santa Rosa Planning Commissioners. My name is Judy Chen, I live East State Drive, south of Highway 12, with my family for more than 13 years. Um, thank you for the opportunity to express my opinion about uh, the proposal. So first that uh, I want to talk about is from the perspective of the care of the patients. Uh, first, the patients are living in the seven units upstairs of the 5761 Monohawk Drive have direct access to outside how to control the patients in and out by office manager or medical staffs are downstairs most of the time. The patient's supervision is not adequate. It opens more opportunity for the patients to take drugs of their choice or smoke easily. And second, when patients are going to groups to go upstairs or downstairs at the same time, they can only use the small elevator or the stairs. So most of the patients may experience depression, anxiety, or hallucination while detoxing. Using stairs outside to go upstairs and downstairs is unsafe and dangerous for them. And also assuming patients will follow guidelines while supervision is not sufficient, is not practical. Alcohol and drug addiction is so powerful. The people who struggle with it may manipulate their friends to bring their drugs to them as all the units can be easily accessed from outside and there's a uh, plenty of open space in the back. In addition, the medical hospital uh, and the social service facility are too far away from the location. 
the Memorial Hospital, the Kaiser, the Sutter are all minimized away. And then, you know, if the patients need that, waiting for an ambulance or a bus uh, could be problematic for patients. So we have more than 500 houses in the Skyhawk neighborhood. It's a great community with good people and good school. Um, it's true that okay. our society- Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the next speaker, has the name of Marin County Fire Department. So I'm not, I, if you could please uh, state your name for the record, um, that would, we would appreciate that. Marin County Fire Department, I sent you a prompt. Can you unmute yourself? Looks like they've gone away. <laughs> Okay. So the next speaker is Paul Booker. Paul, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Yes, well, thank you for listening. This is Paul Booker. I live about 200 yards from the post facility. Some questions I have for the presenters today. I have had my hand raised ever since the presenter presented, but he apparently didn't notice it. I heard on the one hand that this is not going to be a lockup, but I heard on the other hand that the clients cannot leave the facility. Um, uh, so can you help me resolve uh, what's the real position there? And I didn't get a chance to ask that question at the end of the presenter's presentation. My hand was raised, no one noticed. Other questions, uh, I heard about 24 parking spaces. Um, but I hear the clients will not have access to their cars. So why are we worried about 24 parking spaces? Um, that's all I really had for questions. I'd look forward to some answers. And I did want to raise my hand following the presenter. No one noticed. Um, thank you, Mr. Booker. And let me just uh, uh, kind of talk about process quickly. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with um, our process uh, at city meetings and public hearings. Um, the, there's not an interaction between the public comments and the applicant. Um, public comment portion is after the applicant makes their presentation, then the public makes their comments, and then we as a commission, commission ask those questions of the applicant. So we did see your hand raised, but it wasn't an appropriate time uh, to call on you. So just wanted to pass that on. Um, the next speaker, and excuse me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, is Ching Shu. I sent you a prompt if you could please state your name for the record. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right, good evening. My name is Ching Shui. My family, including my 13-year-old son, a resident of Skyhawk. I'm opposed to put such a facility at that location. I would like to remind the commissioners that the original plan for under Picant was to put a 24-bed addi addiction recovery center on the second floor and an outpatient treatment center of up to 35 patients on the first floor. Now they're changing it to the inpatient only. I don't know if they just changed the strategy to apply them in phases, like they did for the six under and then uh, six under first and above six. I hereby request the planning commission not to approve any addiction recovery facility above six, no matter it is inpatient or outpatient. That building is part of the commercial center that has the purpose for serving the daily needs of Skyhawk community. We purchase the houses here and pay extra tax so our children can go to the good schools, enjoy the playground and park close by, and meet with wonderful neighbors. The rehab center doesn't bring any value to the community here and will depreciate our property value significantly. We do have evidence of that. In addition, the building you're looking at is supposed to provide diverse type of housing. One of my colleagues used to live in one of the apartments where exactly the applicants want to put the rehab at. To approve this application is to cut the available of seven housing for the families of diverse size and incomes who could be eligible to enjoy the same as we do. I request the zoning staff to recheck the general purpose of this site in the original Santa Rosa development plan. Though the applicants draw a picture that their patients are close to quiet angels, however, we all know that addiction is a mental issue. Let me emphasize, I'm not against the addiction recovery, but the location. You need to consider not just the impact to the environment and the community, 
which in this case, I don't think the zoning staff that did assessment thoroughly, considering the needs of the patient, they should be more accessible to the families who need it closer to public services and the medical services. We should also con consider the rel relapse risk. In this case, there's a pop right downstairs. So thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is DJ. And if you could state your name for the record. DJ, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Okay, um, my name is DJ Femister. My wife and I live near the Skyhawk Village Shopping Center. I'm a retired police sergeant with experience supervising a narcotics unit as well as an investigations unit. I am in opposition to the proposed community care facility. This proposal is actually to combine what was previously seven separate residences, which will now be combined into one facility. Would this be allowed with seven separate houses? Definitely not. Why is it being allowed here? Same arguments to allow this to happen here could apply to any residential street in the city. It's a rationalization that suits the wishes of the applicant and ignores the wishes of the neighborhood and existing codes. I have many questions. Based on the physical layout, I don't believe they can possibly keep track of 24 clients and ensure their safety and the safety of others without some sort of surveillance system in the hallways and outside common areas. Staff members can't be everywhere all the time. If someone overdoses on fentanyl and dies in the facility, shouldn't there be a way to backtrack and see where it came from? My understanding is there's nothing physically to prevent the clients from walking out anytime they wish. Video monitoring and recording of common areas, walkways, and the smoking area should be required. It has been my experience that people addicted to drugs and alcohol can be very creative in coming up with ways to obtain, conceal, and use them. There should be some way to check back when this problem occurs. The applicant states that any clients not meeting sober requirements will be removed from the facility. What exactly are sober requirements? Will they be ejected after one failed drug test or two or 10? Does removed from the facility also mean removed from the program or do they just stay somewhere else until they are sober and return? Facilities should be required to track drug tests, both positive and negative, and the number of expulsions and disclose all of these numbers. Will the clients be allowed visitors? How so? If so, how do you prevent uh, from contraband being brought on site? Um, will there be repercussions for clients who leave their rooms without supervision? Thank, thank you. Um, the next speaker is Rashmi Sridhara. Rashmi, I sent you um, a prompt to unmute yourself, and can you please state your name for the record? Um, my name is Rashmi Sridhara, and I live on Mount Nahak. I'm an internal medicine physician and a mom of two young girls. With this lens, I hope to share my perspective with you all today. There is no question that there's a need for drug and alcohol rehab, given the contribution of COVID-19 pandemic and the effect that it has had on the mental health of our constituents. This should be a problem that we give the utmost attention. I would like to applaud Pura Vida in taking on this honorable work. I do, however, believe that this location is not the ideal space for a treatment facility for the following three reasons. One, the inherent risk of aggression and agitation and possible violence that is involved in the process of detox and rehab. I have been treating addiction patients daily for years, and I'm typically able to help them with medications and treatments. However, there are occasions when it is difficult to manage. I have personally even had a patient throw a table at me, and many patients physically assault me, even in the safety of a hospital setting. As someone trained to deal with such situations, it is still unnerving to say the least. These experiences have left me concerned about what could happen if such an incident were to occur near Austin Creek Elementary School, where children who have already been traumatized by recent fires are exposed. It is my hope that such occurrences do not take place as it would likely lead to long-term psychological trauma for these young students. Two, the facility is not near emergency services and we lack a plan to care for rehab residents and community members in emergencies. It, is, it appears that the nearest hospital and police department are located about four to five miles away. It is understandable that medical care are, may be needed for rehab residents. Violent acts can also occur, so close proximity to emergency services is important when choosing a location. Additionally, being near a hospital increases the likelihood and, and commitment to the program. Three, medical rehab care will be more effective in a destigmatized environment. 
I truly believe that if a rehab center is established, the community at large will avoid the facility altogether for safety concerns. It is clearly shown that rehab residents do better when they don't feel judged or are taking steps to overcome their disease. I believe that there will be social stigma that contributes to the worsening. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Um, the next speaker is uh, Julia Perlman. Julia, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Could you please state your name for the record? Hello, my name is Julia Coleman. Thank you, Chair Weeks and uh, members of the Planning Commission. I would like first to start by saying that uh, I received uh, an email stating um, Pura Vida's uh, pro uh, project, proposed project for the city, which is it does say Pura Vida is not a methadone or Suboxone clinic and does not deliver medications for clients on site. I would also like to point out that looking at their brochure for their treatment center, it does say that they are um, uh, their medication assistant treatment and of subsequent non naltrexone and vivitrol, which are I'm not a doctor, but uh, for the lack of a better term, are synthetic meth and uh, so on. Um, so in regard to that, when um, when patients are going to be on um, trying to uh, detox, they are going to be uh, they're going to uh, be they're going to have anxiety, they're going to have depression, confusion, they're going to have hallucinations. And given the proximity of the school, which is 400 uh, feet away only, and the kids constantly walking to school, riding bikes to school, um, which will present a danger to our children. Um, we unfortunately will not be able to give our children the basic, uh, their basic uh, childhood uh, experiences of going to school by themselves and experiencing being independent and experiencing going on a bike ride by themselves, which uh, on the walkway, which is right on the opposite side of the treatment center. For all of those reasons, I would like to ask uh, not to uh, not to give um, not to grant uh, minor uh, minor um, CUP to Pura Vida for this location. Although this type of a treatment addiction center is needed, just in a different location. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Tracy. Hello, Tracy, my name. You please state your name for the record. Sure. Uh, hello, my name is Tracy, and I have been living in Skyhawk since 2011. Thank you for offering me the time to participate in this discussion. I would like to start by stating that I'm against the granting of the permit for the use of Skyhawk Village as an adult rehabilitation center. Here are the reasons. The original plan from the city council for this location was to be reserved to support the residents of Skyhawk by providing facilities like fitness center, coffee shop, and restaurant, which will bring convenience and services to our community. The acceptance of this application will have the opposite effect to our neighbors. There will be more concerns and security risks to our community. As you all know that there will be, we have an elementary school, daycares, and a children's park in our community. All of these in a close proximity to the Skyhawk Village. Any 1% of the security or safety risk will be 100% to the whole life of the kids and family. Also, this proposed recovery center will have 24 in-house patients and will be a must bypass facility to enter or leave our community. I strongly hope that the city will consider our opinion and deny the planning of this adult rehabilitation center because of the inconvenience to the community, safety risk and the negative impacts on our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker will be Vincent Crivelli Pfefferling. Vincent, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Hey there, my name is Vincent Pfeifferling. I'm guessing you guys can hear me? Yes. Fantastic. I was born and raised in the Santa Rosa area. However, I'm presently deployed with the National Guard. I've earned a number of medals, including the Meritorious Service Medal. During my service, I spent over three weeks in the ICU when I almost bled to death. I signed up to put my life on the line for this country because I want to be a part of the solution, not the problem. To me, this issue is black and white. Do we want to be a part of the solution in society 
or do we want to continue the problem that's plaguing our city, plaguing our state, and plaguing our country? I want my city to help facilitate recovery for people. Or do we want to ostracize addicts to the outskirts of society? My father was an addict. That's why I care so much about this issue. His road to recovery was not an easy one. And when I was out with him, he got his fair share of dirty looks. But he got help and he got better thanks to caring and compassionate people. I promise you this, if my father did not get the help he needed, he would have been a detriment to society. But thanks to getting assistance, he is now a valued member of it. Today, I've heard a lot of speculation, a lot of what ifs with no basis in statistical facts. Facts should be the guiding force in this discussion, not feelings. So I urge the council, please let our city be the guide, be the beacon of light. Let's be a part of the solution, not the problem. Let's help society as a whole get better one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service. My pleasure. Um, the next speaker will be Mary Ann Pony. Mary Ann, I sent you a prompt to uh, unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Good evening, my name is Mary Ann Pony. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this discussion. I have lived in Skyhawk neighborhood for 23 years. I live one block away from Skyhawk Village. I'd like to start by saying I am opposed to the granting of four of a PIP for a permit for 24 bed facility at Skyhawk Village for a permanent addiction recovery service. I am a retired Sergeant from the San Francisco Sheriff's Department. In my line of work after 30 years, I've seen so many horrific sights of young children hurt and abused. Many are hurt during a drinking spree by an alcoholic or drug addict. Young children are innocent and need our protection. Alcoholics and children don't mix and should not be around one another. Yes, alcoholics need a place for recovery, but not next to a neighborhood built around children and Skyhawk neighborhood was built around Austin Creek Elementary School. Pervita states their clients will not go anywhere outside their housing unit, but how can Pervita say that? Their clinic is not a prison. Their clients come as volunteers into the program and can leave the program at any time. There is not a counselor in their two bedroom unit with them day and night, preventing them from leaving and walking around the neighborhood or going out to smoke a cigarette at two o'clock in the morning. Counselors are not inside these individual apartments 24 hours a day. We as adults need to protect our children and putting a 24 bed facility for alcoholic and drug recovery does not meet that need in this neighborhood. Please vote down this proposal and protect our children and the neighborhood they live in. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you. The next speaker is Wei Zhang Shi. Wei Zhang, can Hi. you state your name for the record? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Wei Xiang Shi, uh, dear chair and commissioners. Thanks very much for giving me this chance to speak here. I live on Sunhawk Drive, Skyhawk community. When I haunted my house in 2017, as the other neighbor mentioned, even though I was told that I had to pay extra property tax for this community due to the special bond for Skyhawk enhancements, but I, I still choose this community. I love this community, love its peace and safety. Kids can walk to school alone. I often go out for walking after dark or go to the Safeway nearby at night to grab the breakfast for the next day. But this will be changed by this project if it's approved. I believe you have received a lot of comments that were from experienced psychologists, physicians, and officers. Their practice said patients will frequently try to slip away from the facility to either have a security or more alcohol and a drug. The fact that the apartments proposed in this application open direct to outdoor introduce more risks. Any accident from an anxious, stressed out, or depressed patient could be, a disaster, could be a disaster to the neighborhood. I support the project, rehab project, but the location of the project is not a good choice. Our group would love to help search if city look for public proposal for the locations. 
For example, one possible alternative option is Stone House at 3555 Sonoma Highway. There is no park issue, no label issue, no school nearby. It's more closer to hospital or medical clinics if they need it. We believe there, there are more options which fit this program better. Thank you again for your timing. This is to my concern. Please consider our request to deny this application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Shelby Moeller. Shelby, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Shelby Muller. I am the school board president for Rincon Valley Union School District. I do not represent the school district in my comments tonight. I'm speaking as a 15 year resident of Skyhawk and a mother of five. I am also active with Project Grad at the high school for the past five years. As you know, that's an organization that provides safe and sober activities for graduating high school seniors to ensure that their graduation night is substance free. I want to express my support for individuals who've chosen to address their addiction and are on the difficult difficult road to a life free from harmful substances. And I also appreciate organizations and individuals who make this their life work. But this bedroom community, which is built with a school at its core, is not the correct location for a substance recovery center. This neighborhood attracts families with young children because it was constructed around a neighborhood public school and park. The applicant spoke about how he chooses to bring his children to work, but the neighbors like me who previously purchased our homes are not getting to make that choice. That choice is being made for us. We are still coming out of a pandemic during which our state and county instituted shutdowns that disproportionately affected our children and youth. Children were cut off from healthy vital services and it adversely affected academics, socialization and mental health. We've seen a massive uptick in destructive behaviors in our schools, much of it at younger ages. Many children have been exposed to very mature content across years of distance learning and with unfettered access to online content. I speak tonight not to um, challenge the merits of this practice, which I don't, or the legality of the permit, though other public speakers have spoken to this. I am just speaking against the, um, to question the virtue of this at this location at this time. It's time for our community to actually put children first. It's time for local government to protect their innocence and stop exposing them to adult problems. Please find another location for the substance recovery facility so they can provide this important service and we can show our kids we value their innocence and take seriously our duty to protect them. Thank you. Okay, the um, we have about 21 more speakers. So um, just wanted to give everybody a heads up on that. Um, so the next speaker is Greg Cohey. Greg, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? My name is Greg Coey. Son of a recovered alcoholic, small business owner in the healthcare industry and husband of a patient advocate. My wife and I have lived in Santa Rosa for over 20 years and reside on Queen Anne Drive, just 360 feet from the proposed facility and our family uses the services of the existing businesses of Skyhawk Village on a regular basis. My main concern that is that the presentation tonight focus on a lot of out of date concerns from before the applicant modified his minor conditional use permit application and did not focus on any of the Skyhawk United's letter outlining how the proposed project violates city zoning codes such as the proposed facility violates zoning requirements of code 20-42.060 because it's 550 feet from an existing care facility, Sonoma Development Center, which is within a thousand foot perimeter of the, that was established to prevent the over concentration. Uh, clear violation of the code, no, no remediation. The staff report only highlights the general plan policies that support this project and do not acknowledge that the location is inconsistent with general plan LUL-E and UD-G-1. Converting the neighborhood center to a community serving center does not service daily needs of the 500 homes and families in the Skyhawk neighborhood. There's no evidence that the proposed facility will service neighborhood residents and clients may come from as far away as San Francisco or even out of state. 
The applicant is also the owner of half a Skyhawk Village, and the priority seems to focus on the request of a for-profit business owned by a non-Sonoma County resident over the concerns and quality of life of Santa Rosa residents. I respectfully request that the Planning Commission deny the minor conditional use permit and have a permanent injunction for a facility larger than six persons. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Tamara Park. Tamara, I just gave you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Hi. Um, good evening. Thank you for your time today. My name is Tamara Part, and I and my husband have lived on Marsh Hawk Drive here for over 14 years in the Skyhawk community. I absolutely believe that Pura Vida Treatment Center at Skyhawk Village will have a negative impact on our neighborhood and community. This is at the main entrance of our neighborhood, surrounded by homes and a nearby elementary school. Many children walk and ride their bikes around our neighborhood, including through Skyhawk Village. I'm very concerned about their safety. In the past decade, I have lost two cousins who passed away due to addiction, including one who was constantly in and out of rehab. Sadly, I know all too well what can happen with addicts, including issues such as driving while under the influence, theft, attracting associates of fellow addicts and drug dealers, just to name a few. I also know that treatment facilities are needed, but not here in a neighborhood that should not deal with the fallout associated with such a facility. I'm also concerned about potential um, hazardous medical ways, increased crime and police activity, as well as a large group of people constantly gathering to smoke at the entrance of our neighborhood at all hours. In conclusion, I would ask, please do not approve the 24 bed Pura Vida Center at Skyhawk Village. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Kathy. Hello, my name is Kathy Ramazzotti and um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I worked for 25 years as a 911 police fire and ambulance dispatcher taking numerous calls with this type of issue of addiction and alcohol abuse. I am now retired. It is my understanding that Skyhawk Village was built contingent upon and per the general plan that the Skyhawk community could be built as long as a local community center was constructed that Skyhawk Village. The key words here, the building had to meet the daily needs of the local community. Pura Vida Recovery Services does not meet any of the daily needs of the local community, so should not be in that business center. Mr. Wignall has originally advised his clients would stay only 30 to, correction, seven to 30 days. It's now up to 90 days and possibly seven months. Um, not one of those clients that will be occupying this space will be a resident. A resident is defined as a person who lives somewhere permanently on a long-term basis. My guess is that not one of his clients will be changing their mailing address, their address on the voting rolls, or changing their bank and credit card accounts to the address on Mountain Hawk. They are transient temporary clients being treated in this business. Clients only that go back to their homes. Although I am a complete supporter of any treatment for alcohol and drug rehab, I am wholeheartedly against your consideration of authorizing any permits for this facility. The next step may be the expansion of outpatient clinics when the other existing businesses have vacated due to the problems from their clients. Your duty is to do what's best for the people of this community. So now you must choose tax money or listening to the community you serve. I'm requesting that the city deny the minor conditional use permit and any other permits that have to do with Pura Vida Recovery Services in this location. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Kim Kohi. Hi, my name is Kim Kohi. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to your weeks and planning commissioners. I'm a patient advocate in the healthcare industry. I've lived in Santa Rosa for 20 years and on Queen Anne Drive since 2018 after, leaving our house in, after losing our house in Fountain Grove. 
My brother and father-in-law have both been through rehab services in the past. We clearly understand the need for it and the importance of these services provided. This location, though, is not appropriate for the following reasons. It's too close to another community care facility in the same neighborhood, even though it's across Highway 12. Clients in detox can have agitation, anxiety, confusion, or hallucinations of withdrawal. A second story location with a corridor balcony and outdoor stairs is unsafe due to increased risk for falls. Having only three to eight employees monitor the activities of 24 clients in six separate apartments during outdoor exercise, free time, and smoking in a space that is 25 feet from the building, as well as prepare all their meals, manage detox symptoms, connect counseling sessions, seems drastically inadequate for appropriate care. There's no mention of mitigation to access the multiple staircases to the second story apartments or medications for the small outdoor space that is shared with a bar and a wooded park behind the facility in a higher face fire danger zone with absolutely no fences anywhere. We feel that the 24 bed facility as well as potential for future outpatient clinic will have a significantly negative effect on the future use of the Skyhawk Village by neighbors in Skyhawk, Redtail, and Melita. The lack of appropriate facilities at this location constitutes cause for the denial of a minor conditional use permit. Thank you for your time and for denying this application. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the next speaker will be Bebe Soon. Oh. Apologies, Chair Weeks. I okay. unmuted the wrong person. That's okay. No problem. Uh, Richard Gallo, um, okay. I just gave you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Richard, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Let's go to the next speaker and then we can come back to him. He may need to update his Zoom settings. Bebe Soon, I just sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Yes, this is Bebe Song. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, dear Commission Chair and Commissioners, uh, thank you for giving me this time to participate in this discussion. My name is Bebe Song. My family live on Great Heron Drive since 2012. Out of the love of our neighborhood and the city we live in, I'd like to state that I'm opposed to granting a permit to use Skyhawk Village as an adult rehabilitation center. Here are some reasons. First, realizing that there will be patients under influence appearing in the neighborhood, I will no longer have the sense of security for my children to play outside in the neighborhood the facility when he or she is stressed out of confinement in the center and especially under the influence of drug or alcohol or seeking for drug or alcohol from outside that is very dangerous to the neighborhood and our children. There are numerous crime reports and news of rehab centers near, near a resident neighborhood. The applicant's declaration that there is no criminal concern is not true. Second, economically, Skyhawk Village businesses will probably be chased out due to safety, traffic and parking concerns. This will cause loss of employment and tax generation. Many of the residents who work remotely may have to sadly move out of this area, causing loss of econ economic prosperity and high quality of education. It will be a chain reaction to the loss of econo economic development in the area and even to the city. There are over 500 households in the vicinity of the neighborhood. The applicant's declaration that this is a low density residential area is not true. Third, I have also concerns about parking and traffic. Even though the applicant declared that there are only six inpatient clients, the plan shows 24 beds. This is self-contradictory. The rehab staff, experts, volunteers, and other non-full-time personnel will not transport within the two vans the applicant declared to accommodate the transportation. The new rehab center will cause insufficient parking spaces shared among the current users. Th thank you very much. 
Um, the next speaker will be Katie Moncada. Chair Weeks, um, before I um, call on uh, Katie, I just wanted to let you know that I had a request from our interpreter in the Chinese channel um, requesting a break. So after we get through Katie, um, could we think about taking a break sometime soon? Sure. Um, after Katie, we'll do uh, another five minute break. Would that work for them? Thank you. Yes, that's great. Thanks. Um, okay, Katie, I'm going to send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Hi, my name is Katie Moncada. Um, am I good to go? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, I just want to start off by saying that I am in favor of the Pura Vida project. Um, I will say that uh, a little over seven years ago, I found myself in a position in my life where I needed some help with a drinking problem. And um, I had to go out of the county to find a facility um, for inpatient treatment. After I left, I um, went to Pura Vida's Sober Living Environment Services that they have. And I will admit that I was a little reluctant and um, I, I, I didn't really want to go. <laughs> um, but I learned that that was because of my um, ignorance and my prejudices that I had at what I thought drug addicts and alcoholics look like. Um, what I've learned is that Pura Vida is um, a great company and I truly believe that they save lives. I truly believe that the drug and alcohol epidemic that we have is killing more people than is necessary. And we are in dire need in this county for a facility like this. Um, I've heard a lot of people speak negatively about the impacts. And I will just say as an active member in recovery and um, seeing what Pura Vida has done for our community, that's the exact opposite. Pura Vida saves lives. And I don't believe that I would be here today if it weren't for the services that they provide. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and take a five minute break, which would put us back about 7.08, I believe. Thank you.
Are we good to go? We're waiting on Commissioner Holton. Okay. Okay, um, so can you um, do the roll call? Let the record reflect that all commissioners are present with the exception of Commissioner Duggan and Commissioner Okrepke. Thank you. Um, and I would like just to remind folks that um, if uh, somebody else has already made the comment that you were going to make, if you could just say you agree with that comment um, instead of repeating the same comment. Um, so uh, our next speaker is Amanda Medford. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent, thank you. Again, my name is Amanda Medford. I don't claim to be an expert, but I do have close to, um, very close experience with um, both Sonoma County and out of county residential rehab facilities um, over the last 12 or so years, including both extensive volunteer and professional experience. I'm also a homeowner in Skyhawk with young children. And I believe that the Pura Vida project is not compatible with our neighborhood. I appreciate hearing from the owner tonight. Unfortunately, the existing distrust and lack of transparency between the owners, one of the owners and the neighborhood is starting off their relationship on a bad foot and will ensure a nightmare for city officials should they continue to move forward with this project. As exemplified by his behavior now, it will absolutely not be good neighbors or willing to work with the neighborhood to resolve issues that might arise. In my experience, the activity level and culture of our neighborhood will dramatically change. One established over 20 years ago when most of these homes were built. The activity that many of the people coming and going and the frequency that will change the tempo and activity level of our quiet neighborhood. Um, in my experience, residents and outpatients will take walks in the neighborhood, go on outings in the neighborhood, do court ordered and non court ordered visits with their families, um, likely at our park. The sheer number of residents um, turning over and um, if they're successful, they'll be replaced. But though the owner was unwilling to discuss success rates, to my knowledge, it's less than 50%. Um, when they do fail the program, where do they go? How are, they how are they transported? In my experience, they leave at all times of the day, usually very upset and in a rush. Chances are they'll be in a poor state of mind and headed right into our neighborhood. With 24 beds and less than 50% success rate, that's a lot of people leaving the program monthly. I also agree with the issue with the existing facility already in our neighborhood. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Anastasio. Anastasio, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Anastasio, I can see that you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. There you are. Sí, buenas noches. Está una persona que habla español. Uh, lo siento, Anastas Anastasio. Uh, no tenemos un uh, persona se habla español. So han tomado han tomado tres um, quebradas para traducir. Y miro que no tienen una persona que está que habla español. So, mi comentario es, ¿por qué están te tienen un, un comentario público y no tienen traducción en español? Sí, es correcto. No tenemos una um, persona que habla español. So, my comment is, we've take, I've been on the meeting for over an hour and a half. We've taken three breaks for translation. And there's no translation in Spanish. If we're having a public forum, we need to be equitable to the Spanx community, especially that is a topic that is very important to Skyhawk community, that there are Spanish speaking families here, and this is not being translated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker would be Jin Hui Yang. 
gang. Jin Hui, I just sent you a prompt. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Jin Hui Yang. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, dear Chair and the Commissioners, thanks for the opportunity for me to speak up in the meeting. My name is Jin Hui Yang. I have lived in Skyhawk since 2016 when my older child started kindergarten. I want to speak against the proposal of using Skyhawk Village as a drug rehab center. Add to my fellow neighbors' analysis, I want you to share about my personal experience. I still remember that the first time I looked at the house for sale in Skyhawk neighborhood in 2016. After looking at the house, my agent took me to sit down at Rick's rest restaurant to continue the discussion. I felt so grateful and cheerful at that time because this Limford has such a convenient shopping center within walking distance. This gave me a great neighborhood feeling with Skyhawk Village at the front gate of Skyhawk neighborhood. We had a good conversation that day and I finally decided to make an offer to my first home. Yes, I wanted to buy a house in Skyhawk neighborhood because I want my child to go to Austin Creek Elementary School. In the meantime, the convenience of small shopping village together with the attorney entrance make me feel beyond every day I get back home. I'm currently working for fully remote, but I still choose to stay in this great neighborhood. If this 24 rehab center will be set in the Skyhawk village, I would not feel secure to go to the Rick's restaurant or walk to the fitness center. I will feel very insecure to have my kids walk to from school and hang out with friends by themselves. Ultimately, I look, I lost my um, cherish the home feeling. I strongly hope that the city planning will consider the feeling of our neighborhood residents and deny the planning for this adult rehab center in Skyhawk Village. I do support the project, but not in this uh, center, in this uh, location. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ginny Laughlin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I am a neighbor in uh, the south side, on the south side of Highway 12, and I listened to Mr. Wignall's presentation and noticed that their company has only been in business for fewer than six years, and their existing operations have only six residents per location. So if we were to expand to 24 patients, that would be a fourfold expansion of anything that they have to date had any responsibility for. I feel that this is an experiment on our neighborhood that is not warranted and could be dangerous. Also, Mr. Wignall indicated that the average patient will stay three to 14 days. So that would give us a transient population that would be constantly changing. In addition, he said that those people would be bused to a west side location daily from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So why the east side location for them to be residents? Would it not make more sense for them to be housed closer to the west side location where they are going for treatment during the day. I feel that this is not an appropriate location. It's an experiment on our neighborhood. It's way too large a transient population. And I agree with all the previous commentators about the potential dangers from the law enforcement population that we've heard from and I request that the minor use conditional permit be denied. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did want to mention uh, in response to the uh, comment about uh, translation that um, translation needs to be requested in advance so we can have um, an inter interpret interpreters on site uh, to do that, uh, which was done with uh, the request for the Mandarin interpretation. 
So I just wanted to let the public know that. Um, the next speaker is Anastasia Maziars. And, and I am totally apologize for my pronunciation. <laughs> Thank you, no problem. Um, hello, my name is Dr. Anastasia Majash. I'm a family medicine doctor. I have been practicing for over 10 years. Can everybody hear me? Just wanted yes, to check. Thank you. Yes, okay. Um, I have been treating patients with substance abuse and drug dependence. And obviously those are not, um, it's a terrible um, condition to have. And I totally understand the need to have treatment for those patients. However, I do not feel like um, our Skyhawk neighborhood is the right place for them. A lot of times patients with um, dependence issues have other mental issues and most likely they need treat more treatment than the Pura Vida can give them at this location, can be able to provide. Detox can be very dangerous to the patient going through, the, through it. There's lots of mental status changes. There's risks of um, violence, hallucinations, wandering to the community. We have lots of small children in this area. Also smoking outside the facility creates a high risk of uh, fire. And as we know, there's a well-known restaurant loved by lots of Skyhawk families and the kids being so close, exposed to the smoking situations and different transients people coming in and out. It's not such, it's, it's a negative thing. There is no outside space for the um, um, patients. There's no area to exercise. And obviously, I mean, the initial purpose of that Skyhack village was to benefit families of Skyhack, benefit the children and have uh, more like a organization type of, um, type of um, place for the whole Skyhawk community. So I would not, I would have anything I would ask not to accept the application. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jeremy Pierce. Jeremy, uh, could you, oh. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking my phone call. I'd like to say thank you for putting on this uh, public forum. Um, I agree with a lot of the, the folks that have spoke in, um, in to deny this application. Um, they all have said some great stuff, and I agree with most of them. I'm going to talk a little bit with about common sense. And uh, we can talk about statistics. We can talk about what's going on. We can talk about um, people's interpretations of things, but but let's talk about common sense. You're putting a, a care facility next to an elementary school, down below or up above, excuse me, a bar, across the street from another facility. All of those make no sense. Okay, the folks of uh, of Skyhawk have endured a lot of this, and and we fully support um, people with these type of addiction problems. That being said, you can only ask a community to do so much. We have the Queen Anne facility. You also have the facility that's being put in just down the street, which is a low income housing facility. And all of these go against what we're trying to accomplish here in this neighborhood, which is to, to provide a community uh, surrounded by a school. I moved here 10 years ago to provide, to provide a school system for my kids. I moved from across the neighborhood, across the, um, the city to this community because this community was surrounded and started by the school system here, not by a drug rehab facility. I didn't move here because, wow, there's a great drug rehab facility. I did move here because there's a great school system. That's why all of these people in the Skyhawk community have moved or live here is because they support this school system. This goes against that 100%. My question to the commission, as well as to the county supervisors, as well as the city supervisors, are you going to re? Are, are you going to support the two? Um, Can you uh, finish up, please? Your time is up. Yeah. Are you going to support the restaurant? Are you going to support the workout facility? Are you going to support those businesses there? They're going to lose businesses. Thank, are thank you. Are going to lose customers? Here. 
Thank one. you. That's my question. Okay, the next speaker will be Kuhn Lee. Kuhn Lee, I gave you permissions to speak if you can accept my prompt and please state your name for the record. Uh, Wedding 的影响很大之外，对于我们这些成年人，其实也有一定的影响。我的脑海里会浮现浮现出非常具体的场景对比，让人很是不安。比如，天气好的时候，我自己经常步行去Spring Zai 而这种环境也势必会极大地降低本社区的整体品质和发展潜力。同时也会降低每个居民房屋的价值。这对于现有居民的利益将是很大的损害，也是非常不公平的。谢谢大家，Thank you. Uh, so uh, I moved here uh, 13 years ago to Skyhawk, and my children graduate from Austin Creek elementary school. Uh, I feel this is not only impacting on the children, but also uh, has a huge impact on the adults. Uh, in my mind, uh, on a good day, I would go to the Screen Lake, uh, take a walk. Um, usually I feel very pleasant looking at the sky and uh, a nice environment. I see all these healthy people uh, traveling along the way and uh, if uh, if we have this detox center come here then I I feel I would this would impact my uh, environment and uh, we would feel very frustrated by this and uh, we also have outside population moving into this neighborhood and also would have a huge impact on the environment on the environment and the uh, uh, residents here. So it will also impact, uh, has negative impact on the development and uh, of a business, uh, economic development of this area and the depreci depreciate our real estate value, property value. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next speaker will be Julie Lin. Julie, I gave you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Uh, this is Julie Lin. Okay, um, let me start. So my name is Julie Lin, uh, dear commissioner um, and the chairs. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you tonight. So this is my first public uh, hearing um from today's have uh, two cases you can see that so so much difference the first one only one only have one comments but the second one you can see how many people will wants to speak up and uh, and also um so many people has been speaking before i totally agree most of them so i i'm speaking here against the proposal rehab center in skyhawk village and i heard two people a favor on this project, but those two people not live in Skyhawk. So you can see, even though the owner um, 
state to say this project will not impact the neighborhood. You can see how much people will speak up. Just like us, we're normally very silent people, but we wanted to still speak our voice to, to commission. So um, I wanted to point out another thing is the, the, the owner say will not have a negative impact to the house value. But according to the California Health and Safety Code Section 11834.22, when we sell our house, we have to disclose this information to the buyer because uh, the, the code required if you have a nearby rehab center has more than six residents, we need a disclosure of, of this information. Or those pointed to, it means they will impact our house value and will impact our neighborhood. So I just strongly um, ask commission to reject this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Yu Yang. Yu, I, there you are. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Uh, my name is Yu Yang. Thanks for giving me the chance to speak today. I am a registered engineering technician. I have lived here for over two years and love this peaceful community. I have a few concerns about the plan of this rehab center. The first is medical concern. Uh, according to the project description, the clients will be monitored closely and the vital and bath will be checked regularly. My concern is how to monitor detoxification and withdrawal symptom up to every 15 minutes for up to 24 clients with limited staff especially in the night with the clients split among multiple individual apartments. My second concern is supervisory concern. The individual apartment is concerning as to how medical staff will monitor for six separate apartment entrances, as well as concurrently escorting clients to a smoking area when the location of the entries, when, when the location of the office is not in direct view of the apartment entrances. Moreover, the project description mentions whenever it is beneficial clients are expected to move around and engage with other clients, the staff, as part of the recovery, individual apartments are prohibited in reaching this goal. If the clients wants to go to the, the neighborhood, how would the rehab center stop it and ensure the safety of the neighborhood? especially after the clients has been removed from the recovery. In conclusion, I agree with David Chen, uh, Amanda, and um, my neighbors who are against the Pure Veda project. This project is not compatible with our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Thank Jack Sheen. Thank you. For it. Hello, uh, yes. my name is Jack Chin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so my, uh, again, hello everyone. My name is Jack Chin. I have, we have been living in Sky Hub for more than 12, 12 years. I agree with all the comments from few, uh, previous speakers who are against the this facility. And for the speakers who support this facility, I don't disagree with them, but I'm strongly against this uh, specific facility because it's too close to the elementary schools. Uh, although the applicant claimed that the patient will be supervised at all times, this, this site is wide open without fences and locked gates. So it won't be difficult for the patient to get out and get access to drugs. I'm not saying those patients are bad people, but their behavior could go out of control and already influenced from drugs. And so this is a big a security concern for the kids who walk to and from school or play on the street in the neighborhood. <clears throat> so I have a daughter. If this rehab center is approved, I will have no choice but to tell my daughter to not walk or play outside by herself or beside the kid without a dog. I do go to and will also stop going to the coffee shop and restaurant. I, I'm sure there will be a lot of other people 
doing the same thing, which will eventually drive some or all of those small businesses in Skyhawk Village out of business. And this applicant himself just set the bar next to their other facility in Santa Rosa went out of business, uh, probably for the same reason. And I actually went to the city hall. I talked, I was told by one of the uh, city planners face to face that if some patient get out of the facility and harass, assault the local resident, it'll be just a police issue. And the uh, rehab center will have nothing to do with it. Thank you very much. And um, so the next speaker is Lane Jackson. Hi, my name is Lane Jackson. Thank you first and foremost for giving so much time, especially late into the evening to let us speak. Um, you know, as Mr. Wignall did a, a, a good job of spinning a positive thread, but I feel we've been driven down somewhat of a one-way street as we are and have been this entire time lacking full transparency. Of course, you can't sell it with a pitch on your failures, but in this case, they seriously matter. I'm concerned as all of our neighbors are with safety, property values, and everything else, I agree with them. I'll approach this a little differently. First, I wanna say that I have zero stigma on uh, people in rehab, drug addicts, alcohol addicts, criminals for that fact. I'm gonna open the book a little bit on, my, on myself for you and all of our neighbors. Although now I own two local small businesses with my wife, as a young man, I made some bad choices. I became a statistic I swore I'd never become. I was a re-offender. Not everybody knows, but 85% of offenders re-offend. That absolutely killed me. And I worked very, very hard to get back out of that. And I have complete and total empathy for everyone fighting addictions and digging themselves out of the hole of criminal prosecution, as I know how undeniably hard that can be. Um, but knowing that there is not a positive success rate lack of securities and the fact that there will be court ordered nonviolent clients in this facility many of whom will reoffend and or relapse that's a statistic i don't feel comfortable with at the entrance to our neighborhood so i vehemently suggest and request that the committee deny the minor conditions use permit thank you very much thank you the next speaker will be richard golub Huh? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for, uh, for hanging taking, in with us. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got a ways to go. Thank you for taking the time. My name is Richard Golub. I'm a certified registered nurse and anesthetist over at Kaiser. I am not speaking on Kaiser's behalf, but these are my own opinions. Um, I, a couple of points that I'm going to try and squeeze these in as quickly as we can. I know this has already been stated, but I want to reiterate it. We already suffer, suffer from a critical shortage of low-income housing. This is true throughout California, but also especially true in our neighborhood. Removing apartments from circulation in order to place a clearly controversial drug rehab center is nonsensical in my opinion. Uh, I, I know we spoke to this a tiny bit earlier as well, but on what planet is it a good idea to place an alcohol detox and rehab above a full bar? The idea that we we simply these these owners simply cannot find another facility not adjacent to a bar defies logic and is simply asinine um uh i have uh, talked to uh, two of the businesses below this and are both are, con are significantly concerned both the gym as well as ricky's i'm not sure how familiar you are with this facility or this this location but it's gone through a variety of businesses before we finally settled on a successful business uh, Ricky's. Um, the traffic smoking and loitering that is a, uh, and loitering that is endemic to these uh, centers is, a, is, is is simply inappropriate. The uh, glossy pamphlets that they release and, and the, the the sort of rosy um, the, the, the the rosy picture that they paint is simply not true. If you want any further proof, you can think about what happened to Jerry Garcia, who managed to overdose inside a further locked facility. Um, and, and, and died. I mean, the the idea that these are, are safe and insolent from the community is simply absolutely untrue. I would invite you and beg you to, to reconsider this permit and deny it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Daniel Yan.
，主席和委员们好，感谢你们今晚给我发言的机会。我是丹妞岩，我在这边的一间华人华人教会工作。我反对在 Sky 号、Sky 号和 v i l l a g e 设立二十个床位的解读戒毒中心，理由如下：第一，那些需要解毒戒毒的人可能会有激动和暴力行为从里面跑出来。前段时间就有一个这样的病人闯进 Sky 号和一个人家里，女主人逃到屋顶上打九幺幺求助，而我的两个孩子就在这附近的学校读书，并且他们也会到附近的公园玩耍，这对他们的我对他们的安全很担忧。第二，在 Sky 号可有一百多个华人，我所在的教会有好些会友的家庭都在这个区域，他们都向我表达了对这个项目造成的不安全因素引起的担忧。我希望他们有一个安全舒适的居住的环境，这对他们啊基督教的信仰是有很大帮助的。第三，我会为这些需要解读戒毒的人祷告，同时也希望政府可以找到一个更为合适的地方来帮助他们。盼望你们做决定的时候考虑我的上述意见，谢谢 ，Thank you。OK， 啊、um...。Uh, this is uh, uh, De- uh, David Yan. Uh, I work for the church. Uh, uh, I'm against this uh, 20 bed uh, facility for the following reason. Um, because uh, I suspect many of those uh, addicts uh, uh, would have aggressive or violent tendency. Uh, not only recently there was uh, 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 they uh, they uh, they took over these uh, houses and uh, the the occupant uh, the female occupant had had to call nine one one and uh, the skyline community has over a hundred Chinese American uh, so they they complain uh, at the church I work for that uh, they worry uh, they have safety concern. So I feel like having a safe environment would help uh, with uh, our you know, church community. Uh, so th- this is the reason why I'm, I'm against uh, this detox uh, facility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Ying Zheng or Zheng. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. So thank you uh, all and the commissioner and the staff for providing the opportunity to have our voice heard tonight. And thank you all to stay late. I'd like to ask the commissioners to deny this application. Um, I'm a physician. I have a 12-year-old um, daughter, and I lived in Skyhawk for five years. I'm, as a physician, I'm in full support of building drug rehab to help people to get onto their feet, but I'm opposed to this location. And um, I like to echo all the concerns of my Skyhawk fellow residents, especially I'm worried Pura Rida is going to expand their outpatient service once they get a footage in Skyhawk Village because this is what they intended to do in the very beginning. And later they withdrew for some reason. This facility serves no help, no purpose, no benefits to our community, but compromises our safety and peace. I like to respectfully ask our commissioners not to approve this proposed project. Thank you all. Thank you. The next speaker is Sam Chen. Sam, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. I, uh, I'm going to ask you to hear me. Okay. 啊、uh, ，我是啊，三川，我住在 Sky 啊附近，在呃 Y Y T 学校这边，我从事婚姻工作。
我想表达的是，呃，建立一个治疗中心是对的，无论呃怎样都会帮助那些需要治疗的人，但是我非常反对。是不能把这种戒毒所、戒烟中心放在这样的啊、呃、地点，啊、呃，这对我们的生活带来非常的不便啊、呃，添加我们的恐惧感啊、呃，而且正规的大型医院也离这种呃戒毒中心呃也比较远，那如果戒毒中心放在我们社区呃中间来啊、呃，会呃建在我们的呃住宅区。呃，我们几个学校啊、呃、都在一起啊、呃、，Austin Creek， 还有这个呃 w h i t e 还有嗯啊啊、呃呃，这个另外一个在呃 s e f w a y 旁边的学区，非常的近，呃，都在十二号公路旁边。我们的生活呃，归宿呃，学习呃，孩子上下课，我们上班下班，那需要戒毒的人会突然。跑出来，或者他们想进入戒毒所的时候，呃，呃，会发生难以想象的事故，因为他们吸毒以后，他们无法，他们没有毒品以后，或者去治疗当中，他们无法控制他们的呃身体以及他们的思想，他们就会发抖，呃，不知道会出现什么样的状况，也会影响我们几个社区的呃孩子，那。孩子放学过马路的时候，呃，当需这样子会造成呃非常呃非常难以想象的事故发生，所以我们不想看到这样的悲剧发生，所以我反对该项目放在这边的原因。谢谢。Thank you. Thank you. 所以这是安全。I work at the YD,、uh, YK s school. I, I, am, I do support、uh, the establishing、uh, you know, institution for、uh, detox, but I feel that、uh, this is the wrong location. And with the, this kind of detox、uh, center at, in our neighborhood, it will cause Terror to our life, and、uh, it's very far from large,、uh, large-scale hospital. So it's in a residential area. So I feel there are lots of school. There are actually three school: Austin and Wicket, and there's another Renee、uh, Center nearby the Safeway. So what do, during our when not, we go to work and get out from work.、Uh, If we have these、uh, people who are under the influence, then they would they they cannot control their behavior, so they would suddenly jump out, and、uh, it, it would cause、uh, they cannot control their phys- physical、uh, action. They would、uh, they shaky and、uh, get tremor suddenly, and also will、uh, when our Children go to school and they travel on the road. They might, because of、uh, these people, cause accident. So I don't. That's why I feel this is not the right choice. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next speaker will be Dave Williamson. Yes. Okay. You can hear me now. Is that right? Yes, we can. Great, thank you.、Um, my name is Dave Williamson, and I'm a, a homeowner of this.、Uh, this I've been here for、uh, 21 years. We moved here specifically for the purpose of coming to Austin Creek because it was rated as the highest、uh, scholastically rated school in Sonoma County, and Sonoma County is the highest rated county at that time in the state of California. So, but I want to let you know my my perspective. Comes specifically from my experience of dealing with、uh, people with drug, alcohol, and opiate addiction. I've been helping them、uh, initially with my son's、uh, friends, and then、uh, now it's expanded to other people. And I have experienced every kind of situation dealing hands-on,、uh, caring for these people、uh, as I do, as my whole family has. We've done everything. We've provided food. 
shelter, uh, every kind of amenity you can imagine for these people. And I want you to know that I uh, am thankful for Pure Avaida, for what they do, for the, uh, I call it a ministry for what they're doing. But at the same time, the, the last place we need to have this is here in front of a, a residential situation. I want to provide a, a way of looking at things. I'm going to be, if I'm driving down the road and I take a look to my left before Calistoga Road, I see uh, nine, uh, 99 uh, low-income houses that will be going up. And that's going to uh, dra drive much more drug abuse to our, our neighborhood. We come to the intersection of uh, Mountain Hawk and uh, in Highway 12. We look to my right and I see the house the, the roof of uh, a drug treatment center that already puts this off the table. It is illegal for that to happen, for them to be there. This is, should be done and over with. Okay, and then I look to the to the left and I see these people having, uh, oh, geez. Mr. I, Williamson, uh, your time is yeah. up. Yeah, there's so much more. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is J.S. If you could please state your name for the record. J.S., I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you accept my prompt? Let's go um, to the next speaker who has a name of Zoom user. If you could please state your name for the record. Do you hear me? Yes. Can you please state your name? Hello? Yes. Can you state your name? Hello? Hello. We can hear you. Can you please state your name? I am Christine Muscatel. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. I have lived in Skyhawk for 20 plus years. I have raised three uh, children in this community who attended local schools, including Austin <coughs> Creek. And I agree with the previous comment about Queen Anne Care Facility. We already have a nearby facility. Um, Skyhawk Village was supposed to serve the community about 17 years ago. Me and my three kids attended an Easter egg hunt on the lawn where this facility is supposed to exist. The neighborhood met together with our young children, um, you know, on the lawn outside where this rehab facility is proposed to exist. And we um, met together with our children and searched for Easter eggs on the lawn um, with, you know, the children all had their Easter egg baskets. And it was a lovely family event um, with the community, our neighborhood. Um, that was the proposed, um, purpose of the Skyhawk Village. And um, I just want to please um, support the, ex the um, existing plan service of the Skyhawk um, Village and keep the original intended use and deny this 20 bed facility um, rehab center. Um, this is a very child um, centered neighborhood and I thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, the next speaker is Chun Lan Quinn. Or Sh Shin. Hi, my name is Chun Lan Chin. Uh, my husband and I, our two young daughters have been living in Skyhawk since 2019. Uh, thank you for giving me this chance to speak, to express my concern and the question for this application. So I have been studying the latest staff report and I have the following three questions. The first question is about the purpose of community care and health facility. According to 20-42.060, the provision of this community care and health are intended to facilitate 
the integration of handicapped person into community life. When talking about integration, the first question you to answer is what kind of community life to integrate and with whom to integrate with. Then the next step is to coordinate with the local community. I can't find any detailed plan from Pura Veda Rehab Center on how they will achieve this goal. And I, all I find is how they will supervise their clients, check and test every 15 minutes, something like that. Then the clients will live in around one or two weeks. My second question is about the general plan goal and policy, LUL-F, to maintain a diversity of neighborhood. Diversity means difference, but also connection. Based on the information provided by Pura Veda and based on our labor's voices, this rehab center will be an isolated island in Skyhawk community, but physically located in the center of this neighborhood. So it fills with the general plan goal. My last question is about the validation of whether this application meets the zoning code. Neighborhood commercial zoning is used to provide day-to-day -day needs of local neighborhoods. Before we know the day-to-day -day needs of local neighbors, we cannot see whether it complies with the code or not. And Thank, our you. Thank you. Your, your time is up. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Kate Jehu. And just a reminder before you start the timer, um, if you agree with somebody who's already spoken, if you could just mention that um, instead of repeating um, the same comments, that would be great. Thank you. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Lovely, thank you. My name is KJ Hugh. I'm a resident of Sonoma County, a person in recovery and the program director of Pura Vida Recovery Services. I pride myself on the work that I do and that I get to go to work each day and make a difference. I think it goes without saying that I am in favor of this permit being granted. Excuse me, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I wanna share that is my responsibility to review each and every pre-screen that I receive for a potential client with a fine tooth comb. And I'm well aware of what our scope of practice is. While we do serve people who have common co-occurring mental health issues, such as depression and anxiety, we do not accept clients with any severe mental health disorders or that are presenting with any complex symptoms, nor those with histories of violent behavior that would compromise the safety of our clients, my staff, or our neighbors. While these populations are very deserving of treatment, they're just not the specific population that we serve. The scarcity of treatment services available has contributed to the extreme uptick in addiction-related problems in our community, impacting all people regardless of socioeconomic status. With this service being made available locally, people who live in Sonoma County would not be forced to travel far distances from their families or to remote locations to receive the treatment they need. Lastly, I previously worked as a counselor and then as the assistant clinical director at Duffy's Napa Valley in Calistoga, which is, a, which is located directly in the middle of a beautiful and peaceful residential neighborhood. In the several years I worked spent serving at Duffy's, we received, we received zero complaints from our neighbors. Our clients were there to receive treatment and their objective is to get better, not to bother the neighbors. Were it not for facilities such as this, I might not have ever gotten the opportunity uh, to get the help I need and found myself in the position to work for such a wonderful company and to make a difference each day. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Zhongju Wang. Hello? Yes, hello, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Zhonghui Wang, living on Sunhawk Drive. I will post to the rehab center at Skyhawk Village. I do believe it's not appropriate to put the rehab center in a residential community because of the following three points. Number one, safety and security concerns. A rehab center located in a residential area will pose safety and security risks to members of the Skyhawk community. The presence of a rehab center may increase traffic and pedestrian congestions, which could lead to accidents or other incidents. Additionally, the presence of a rehab center may attract individuals who are struggling with addiction, especially one without being properly supervised or accompanied by caretakers, thus potentially leading to an increase in crime and other public safety concerns. Uh, second point, impact on property values. A rehab center located in a residential area may have a negative impact on property values. This is because the uh, presence of a rehab center may be seen as a potential risk 
or inconvenience to potential buyers or renters who may be less likely to purchase or rent homes in this area. This could lead to a decline in property values, which could have negative economic consequences for the local community and the city of Santa Rosa. Point three, disruption of the local community. A rehab center located in a residential area may cause disruption to the local community. For example, the presence of a rehab center may also lead to increased noise, traffic, and other forms of pollution, which could make it difficult for residents to enjoy their homes and neighborhoods. Additionally, the presence of a rehab center may cause conflicts between patients and members of the local community, which could, not, could lead to tensions and declining community spirits. Overall, the decision to operate a rehab center in the residential community should be based on careful, uh, careful assessment of the potential risks and benefits to the local community from all points stated above. Thank you. The presence of Thank rehab you. center could only be de detrimental to the community. So I will know. Uh, please. Uh, thank you. Your time is up. Um, if okay, the next speaker is J S. And if you could please state your name for the record. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is uh, John Shanahan, and I've lived in the community for 27 years. We've been paying taxes here in Skyhawk, including the 25-year bond for all the roads. Uh, we've raised our three children here. They all attended Austin Creek. And we now have our uh, two-year-old grandson with us. He's with us five days a month. So uh, I just, I am not against rehabilitation for people that have addiction. I just think that um, I am going to say it's not in my backyard because this is a residential community. And I just don't think it's the right place for this there is as other people have mentioned there's nowhere for any of the people that are receiving treatment to go for any other activities other than walking through our neighborhood and we've got a lot of children walking around it's just not the right place so i just wanted to state my opinion and i appreciate the time thank you thank you very much um <clears throat> the next speaker is Yanju Wen. Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm going to speak Mandarin, so it's better for me to speak Mandarin. Uh, so I was Skyhawk的这个原因，只有两个。第一个是孩子的safety，大家已经说过了。呃，我每天每个周末的话，孩子都会骑骑自行车在在我们内陆会逛一圈，逛大概三十分钟、四十分钟。但是如果这个rehab
and we don't have to worry about anything. So if we have a, a, a detox facility coming here, then we would have people uh, who behave maybe abnormally or anti, with antisocial behavior can uh, certainly come out into our community. And regardless of the claim by uh, people who are operating uh, uh, this facility or any other claim, uh, with uh, the incoming of the, uh, this facility would basically depreciate our uh, property value very much. So that's why I'm, I'm strongly against uh, the, for the uh, city commissioner to approve this uh, uh, facility. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Janice Simula. Hi, I'm a, um, I actually operate a drug and alcohol treatment center and we're located in the state of Washington, but um, um, we're, we're an hour out of the downtown area of Spokane. And I just wanted to, to alert you guys that, you know, no matter how you watch these people, they are, they can be very, very um, um, <clears throat> hard to um, keep track of. And we've had um, the neighbors come against us, even though we're in a more rural section, our, our plots are 10 acres and 12 acres, and 20, but uh, um, so they're a little further away, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the, um, just having people in the area and, and, you know, we, we had actually had to relocate, um, to a different facility that is even more rural because of the agitation of the neighbors. And they even went as far as getting a petition together and, um, and what was satisfactory for them was that we didn't have our first phase just coming off the streets, just coming off of drugs, um, people that would be at our first phase facility. And, um, you know, we've just still, even though we have people that have been, um, in treatment for a while at our our main facility we still have the police and the emergency services coming thank you yes thank you um the next speaker will be dante hall hello can you hear me yes we can Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. My, my name is actually Brian Hall. I had to have my son help me out for a minute. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so I, I like to say thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'd like to say that I uh, particularly feel for this applicant in choosing this location. Um, I've lived here in Skyhop for over 20 years. We moved here specifically uh, for the school system, which I have utilized for both of my sons. Um, they now both use the Skyhawk Center immensely uh, for the Anytime Fitness Center. Um, my concern is how would they react to someone relapsing, suffering from a, sp a specific problem? Um, you just never know with kids these days. Um, there's lots and lots, you know, it's, you gotta be 14 and older to be able to, uh, as a younger individual to work out at the center. Uh, a lot of these kids, you know, sometimes quick mouth, quick whip, uh, and you just never know, um, you just never know what could happen. Um, the other thing that's, that's pretty concerning is, is the traffic. Uh, when Ricky's and Colleen's coffee shop, when they're in motion, uh, it can get very, very busy down there, it can get very hectic. Uh, has the uh, city ever taken into account uh, the actual count for how many seats uh, are in both of these businesses? Um, I know that for every three seats, there needs to be one parking space. 
Uh, and at times, again, you, you can go in there when any time's in motion, all the businesses are in motion. Uh, there's never any parking on Highway 12. Um, so again, in closing, uh, this is just not the correct location, period, as you can hear <clears throat> from its true Skyhawk residents. And I thank you all for your time. Uh, and I know this has been a, a very lengthy uh, <laughs> uh, problem in, in the meeting for you guys. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, the next speaker is Hong Shin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to speak uh, by Mandarin. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I Skyhawk Village. Uh, we bought a house Fremont. Austin Creek. 上学所以早上起来的时候八点二十左右啊然后十月二十八号我早上从他上学的时候然后遇到了车祸然后车已经报废了我们也受伤了所以直到现在我每次路过那个路口的时候还是很害怕所以 如果建这个戒毒中心的话，嗯，所以我很担心有病人、有医生，还有这家属，所以我担心这个交通会更加的不好，所以我希望大家可以考虑啊我的想法。谢谢大家。Okay, um, so uh, this is Han San. Uh, so we live right across the street from Skyhawk Village. Uh, we moved uh, from Springmount uh, last year, uh, so, and just for the, just because of the neighborhood. And then my my daughter go to school eight o'clock, eight twenty, eight twenty in the morning. And December we had an accident. Uh, we were injured uh, uh, by a. Uh, car so so i worry that if we have this uh, detox center then we're gonna have more patient and we're gonna have more the, uh, physician and the uh, the patient's family member so the traffic is gonna be pretty bad so that's why i'm against uh, this proposal so thank you very much thank you okay um I believe this will be our last speaker, um, we have, and it's Lori. Well, actually, no more speakers. Um, are there? Okay, one more speaker. The hand keeps coming up and down. Um, so if you want to speak, please raise your hand now, um, because we are getting close to the end of this public hearing. So this last speaker or second to the last speaker now is Tracy uh, CUIQ. Tracy Tracy. Hello. Yes, hello. Yeah, my name is Tracy Tree. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I prefer to speak in Mandarin. Yeah, okay. uh, Skyhawk 康复中心的位置在Skyhawk的主通道和12号公路连接的关键位置 刚刚我们听到Owner说 
他们满足火灾撤离的 code。我相信这个 code 是指的他们可以在安全的时间内。呃，撤离。当然，我也呃怀疑他们这个是否能够真正的达到。但是，考虑到我们 Skyhawk 这么多居民，他怎么能保证他们这个位置的选择不会影响我们下一次有可能在火灾的危险中的撤离呢？这是我想表达的第一个原因。第二个原因是，刚刚我和我十二岁的女女儿一起介绍了这个听证会，呃，我女儿就很惊讶于这个项目，她提出来说。这附近没有医院，为什么要在这个地方设一个戒毒中心？他也提出来说，他两岁的妹妹也将要去这个呃 Austin Creek 这个 Elementary School。他说以后有陌生人在我们这个社区中心，呃，走，呃，进进出出的时候，他很担心他妹妹的安全问题。同时，他也提出来，如果在这个位置这样好的 community 要设置一个医疗机构，为什么不是帮助孩子或者帮助老人的？这个更 make sense， 呃，我相信我们全家都很反对康复中心、戒毒中心建立在这样一个位置，呃，是不适合的，对我们整个社区和我孩子以及他同学的家庭来说也没有任何的好处的。谢谢。Thank, thank you. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, Tracy. So, okay, I'm against this proposal for the following two reasons. This is actually my second home in the Skyhawk uh, community. The first, uh, our first home uh, got, was burned down during the 2000 fire. And uh, they, they came over at 11 o'clock to uh, make us leave our house. And at 12 o'clock, the house was already on fire. So, right, uh, and uh, plus this, uh, Detox center is uh, right at the key cross section. Uh, and so I worry if next time there's going to be a fire, it might cause problem for our withdrawal from uh, leaving uh, uh, this uh, leaving this place. Uh, we might have some uh, difficulty. Number two is that when our government hearing that uh, they're going to set up a detox center here. She was shocked because uh, there's no hospital nearby. Uh, and her younger sister, 12, two years old, younger sister is going to go to uh, Austin Creek Elementary School. So uh, so the main concern is safety. So we, we worry there might be a stranger in the neighborhood. And uh, if we have to set up uh, health uh, care uh, facility over here. Why not set up a health care facility for elderly or children? I just don't think uh, th this is a good neighborhood to set up a, a detox center. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Bill. If you could state your full name for the record. Yeah, this is uh, Bill Berthium. And I've been a resident of Skyhawk since uh, 1999. Um, <clears throat> I don't need to get into a big elaborate discussion about this. I'm just totally against <clears throat> against it uh, for all the reasons that people have mentioned: safety, traffic, and property values. So I'm um, I'm definitely dead against it. That's it. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Nancy. Nancy, I gave you permissions to speak. I see that you're unmuted. Uh, can you please try speaking into your microphone? If it's not working for you, you might need to update your Zoom. Uh, you can also call in and the phone number. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Nancy and uh, uh, my family lives in Owl Hill Avenue for more than 17 years. So we asked the committee to deny the permit. Um, people already expressed all the concerns. I just want to add a couple more. One, everything has pros and cons. All we heard so far from the city and the owner are, con uh, are pros. And we also, we were also told that there's no safety concern per police department's report. What is it based on? 
the public has the right to know the cons and from authority. Nobody disclosed the cons or failed cases to us. Um, the second one is the owner's presentation describes a perfect world if everything goes well as planned, as, an, as planned and thought. As far as I know, this is the first time the owner manages a facility of 24 beds. City should really listen to our concerns instead of assumptions to put so many families in test. The third one, the facility is changed from six beds to 24 beds. We have reasons to think that in the future, once the permit is approved, the size can be expanded again. And uh, that's just a strategy. So the, 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 the village is really to support Skyhawk uh, residents' day-to-day -day, day -day activities. So this is the opportunity loss for Skyhawk community. And then next one is, it makes no sense to set up a rehab center next to a bar. Anybody puts themselves in patient's position and think about the temptation to patients when they hear the cheers from the bar. And then I'm not against the, this center itself, but not at this location. And I really think it's, it's our, our, everybody's obligation to kill the root cause instead of uh, put a, a center in the residential area. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Paul Booker. Chair Weeks, Paul Booker, um, apologies, Paul, I see that your hands are is raised, but you already gave your public comment. Oh, thank you for tracking that. Okay, so um, that uh, is our last caller, uh, unless anybody else wants to speak. One more speaker, Jay Levine. Hi, my name is Jay Levine. I've been a resident of Skyhawk since 1999. I'm about a block away from the facility. Um, I do want to just remind everybody that uh, while we all may be against this, that uh, Alex is making this decision to place this unit here uh, as a business decision. I may have missed other speakers earlier who may have um, chimed in that there are other facilities not too far away, such as the Stone House, which is designed specifically for community care, healthcare assisted care. Uh, it, it's perfect. So Alex, if you're looking for a facility with 14 bedrooms and 28 beds, you got it. It's just down the street. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we have one more speaker, um, Chun Li Li. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, my name is actually Yukian Li. I'm and sorry, what's, can you say your name again, please? Yukian Li. Oh, thank you. Um. Most of the points have been said, but like, I feel like uh, it's in a residential area and it's like meant for residents. And I don't think the, um, I don't think Skyhawk really, like the Skyhawk residents need a rehab center. So like, it's just not the, like the best place to build one. Oh, and I'm 14, and I have to, like, not be the safest option, because there's a lot of, like, you, like, never know what people are going to do under the influence, or, like, even if they're attempting to, um, like, stop doing drugs or, like, rehab, uh, it's, like, still a concern. Especially with like all the like elementary schoolers around. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Krittal Desai. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. 
Hi, uh, yeah, uh, I'm Preetal Desai. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I practice in uh, Santa Rosa at an outpatient clinic, and I see adults as well as children and adolescents, uh, all different ages. And over the years of my training and practice, I have um, uh, worked in inpatient as well as outpatient settings, including veterans ho hospital and methadone clinics. Uh, my point being the, uh, that I've seen detoxing patients and uh, what they experience. I'm totally in support of uh, treating patients and especially they go through such traumatic uh, life experiences and many have been uh, uh, victim to uh, drug abuse because of un, um, uh, life circumstances. So I'm definitely in support of uh, uh, rehab facility, but I believe that this uh, community is not a good place. And uh, coming from a child psychiatrist point of view, I see pa patients, children, adolescents who are dealing with such major drug crisis, especially with all the stress going on in the world, uh, including the COVID that has led to such uh, devastating uh, consequences to children's mental health and exposing our children in Skyhawk community to drug uh, addicts who may be uh, roaming in our vicinity in Sky around Skyhawk village is uh, definitely a, a risky place to begin with and i'm totally against it and i i, I think uh, it should not be given the permission to continue with their uh, rehab thank you thank you and if i could remind the upcoming speakers that if um your uh what you're going to say has already been said if you could just say you're in agreement with that um uh, instead of repeating the the comments, um, that would be helpful. Um, the next speaker is Thomas C. Hi, I'm Thomas and I just, um, I grew up living in Skyhawk and um, I went to Austin Creek and I grew up in the Ringo Valley district area. So I just want to like provide a voice for like the kids who grew up in this area. And, um, you know, I'm really blessed to have lived in an area where I could go to Austin Creek at like 11 p.m. and like play basketball and like feel perfectly fine. So um, I just don't feel like it's the smartest decision in terms of like the placement of where everything is. I went to Skyhawk Village as a kid with my friends. We would go biking and walking and, you know, we'd have a lot of fun, but um, it doesn't seem like the smartest decision. So uh, I just wanted to like voice the opinion of um, someone who grew up in this area. So, yeah. Thank you. The next speaker is Hong Ming Zheng. Hello. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my name is Hong Min. I'm from the Skyhawk, uh, uh, yeah, really. Uh, so I all agree the comments from my neighborhood, and I against uh, uh, this project. Yeah, why I heard this uh, project uh, uh, during the Halloween, yeah, first time. But, uh, you know, uh, during the Halloween and uh, when I work uh, in uh, the, the street, uh, uh, work with the, my daughter together. We are freely and uh, see, yeah, it, it's very happy. But uh, if this project is approved, I think the whole situation will be changed and we cannot see uh, this scenario uh, again. I mean, uh, our kids, our neighborhood, I think we will not have this kind of happy scenario yet in our community. So we all currently are uh, living very happy and uh, and because of the good situation and the environment. But uh, if this project approved, I don't think this scenario will keep uh, always it will be changed uh, because it is a, a different, uh, I mean, this will, this will change our happy life environment, definitely. 
I think. So, young words are against this project. Okay, thank you. Thank you.、Yeah. Okay.、Uh, the next speaker is Oscar Tang. Oscar, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh yes.、Uh, actually, my name is Anna. Is Oscar's mom. So I'm the I'm the resident of the Skyhawk since 2013. Almost I lived there ten years. So when my son is seven years, we move in. We pick this place to live because that time I feel safety and quiet and nice neighborhood. But now, for recently, I sad and feel bad also, and because I heard they will build a rehab center and for. Uh, nearby my、uh, my my place, so、um, because、uh, I don't think that's good for、uh, that's a good idea for raise the kids if they build the rehab center here, so around the community. So that's is business that's for the business, but not good for us, you know. So I disagree that's the project. I. Uh, uh, please think about that and、uh, listen. All the people, and uh, so um, that's 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 what I think. So I'm not very great for this the project. So think about that. But thank you, thank you, give me the chance, and、uh, let me speak something. Thank you.、Uh, so with that, that is our last speaker.、Um, so with that. Well, we have one more speaker. Hand just raised.、Um, Robin Wang. Robin, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Yeah, can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. This is Robin Wang. I moved to here roughly seven years ago from Singapore. The reason why I moved to Santa Rosa, especially Skyhawk area, is that the friendly people here. And the safe environments, and it's also a good culture to、uh, stay together with my two kids. One in the Austin school, another is in the kindergarten. So, it will be my heavy concern if there's a drug、uh, a store over there. So, totally, I object for this project. Thank you. Thank you.、Um, and we have one more speaker whose hand just raised.、Um, Luke Reamer. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I, I'll keep it brief. I, I just want to say I agree with the other sentiments that have been shared. I have the same concerns.、Um, my house looks directly out back onto the property in question. I'm looking at it right now as I'm speaking to you, and so I share a lot of the concerns the neighbors have said. My main question, though, is I, I don't understand the process, and so perhaps at the conclusion of this meeting. I'd like to understand what is the process going forward to consider the community's comments and、um, how, how does this go forward? Because、um, that, that's not something I'm familiar with. Thank you. Thank you. So with that,、um, we will go ahead and close the public hearing on this item and bring it back to the commission.、Um, and I think、um, because we've been sitting here for quite some time now,、um, if we can take a ten-minute break. Uh, which would get us back at about 8:42,、uh, and then we'll、um, start our discussion at that time and take our questions. Thank you.
Lonnie, are we ready to go or do you well, need a few more minutes? Uh, we're ready on our end, but I don't see Commissioner Holton or Commissioner Cisco. Okay. I'm sure they're there. <laughs> There they are. Okay, um, so do you wanna do uh, the roll call? Yes, uh, let the record reflect that all commissioners are present with the exception of Commissioner Duggan and Commissioner Okrepke. Thank you. And just wanna mention to the public that we have closed the public hearing portion of the meeting. And um, after about 63, I believe, members of the public. Um, so with that, we'll bring it back to the commission. And um, do you, let's start off with uh, questions. And then um, after that, we can do our usual uh, comments. So um, do you, uh, who would like to start with questions? Uh, Commissioner Cisco, thank you. Are we asking questions of staff or of the applicant? Um, let's start with questions for staff first. Okay. I don't have questions for staff. Oh, okay. Uh, does anybody have questions for staff? Uh, Vice Chair Peterson. Um, yeah, I think I've got a, a couple. Uh, one of them is um, we've, we've heard a couple things about property values going up or down. Um, is that something that is uh, uh, the commission can consider when weighing these kinds of land use? Uh, good afternoon, or well, no, I guess it's good evening, uh, Chair and, and members of the commission, Jessica Jones, Deputy Director of Planning. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the question, Vice Chair Peterson. Um, that's an excellent one. Uh, no, uh, uh, property values are, is not something that um, is a finding for consideration um, by the Planning Commission in situations like this. Um, and I, I can keep going. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie and Jones. I can keep going, Chair Weeks, um, sure. if that's um, okay with the Commission. Yeah, why don't you, um, for the questions for staff, and then we'll have questions for applicant, and then, come, then um, ask some of the questions that were raised by the public if we haven't already covered that. Okay, thank you. Um, so it, I think this is another question that the, the public uh, raised was whether or not the number of beds can be expanded under the same use permit. Is that something that could happen? So, um, and I'll, I'll ask um, uh, Planner Bisla to um, clarify for me, but I believe that the approval before you is specifically for 24 beds um, and an ex any expansion of that, um, uh, of the number of beds or of the um, overall, you know, use um, and the description of the use uh, would require either an updated uh, uh, a minor use permit, which would go through a public process or a new minor use permit. Okay, thank you. Um, well, that, that answered my question, certainly. Um, and uh, the, and then the, the, another one I had was the, the over-concentration issue um, and whether that 1,000 foot, can you explain the 1,000 foot uh, buffer that came up several times? Yes, I can. Um, and again, thank you for the question. Um, so the uh, zoning code uh, that is being referred to here is zoning code section 20-42.060. Um, this is for community and healthcare facilities. It, uh, that section of the code provides uh, specific regulations for our um, community and healthcare facilities. Um, and uh, it is specific to um, requirements for community and healthcare facilities that require minor conditional use permits. Um, and those minor conditional use permits are for the large facilities, which would be seven or more bedrooms. Um, and the uh, conditions of approval, uh, subsection C of that section of the code uh, is where we find um, uh, the section on conditions of approval. And that is where the over concentration section uh, is. 
And that is, again, for those large facilities that require the minor use permit. So for a small facility, which would be six beds or fewer, they are not subject to the over-concentration requirements. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. I, I won't take too much more time before letting my fellow commissioners jump in. Uh, Commissioner I Holton. need to have one question for staff. Go ahead, Commissioner Holton. Great. Uh, so I was just curious, since the change from an inpatient outpatient model to exclusively an inpatient model, was a traffic survey done to address some of the public's concern about increased traffic use? Thank you. Yes, there was a um, trip generation memo done by WTRANS. Um, I'm going to pull it up right now. And I believe, um, I believe Gabe Osborne is on here. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the Commission. Gabe Osborne, Deputy Director of Development Services. Uh, so there was actually a chip generation memo that was produced as part of this. Um, and as part of that process, really what we look at is the existing uses on the site. We compare them against the proposed use, and we look at the estimated number of trips that that would produce. In this particular case, the additional trips were 15. And on top of that 15, we then look at the peak AM and PM periods, and that was one and two. So that's fairly low. It's typically 50 additional trips is what generates additional concern on our end. So our, our traffic engineer does not have any issues based on that trip generation estimate. Uh, and I'll also add um, Zach Matley from WTRANS, um, who was part of the group that prepared that memo, is also here if you have any specific questions about the memo itself. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, are there any, uh, Commissioner Carter? Well, would the conversion of the uh, seven units existing in the property to a community care facility result in an actual reduction in our housing unit count? I believe there are currently no tenants there. There were previously um, before the building changed ownership, but currently all of the suites are empty. I believe um, Alex can probably answer that better. Maybe I can state yeah. it quite slightly differently. Does, does Are those units included in our current housing inventory? So yeah, uh, Commissioner Carter, I can I can help with that question. Um, so uh, yes, those units um, are existing. The proposed uh, 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 facility is not proposing to make substantial changes to eliminate those units as being units. Um, uh, they're not proposing to make interior changes that would convert them from a residential uh, unit type to something different. Uh, so those units would still be available for future use as housing. Uh, so they would not be a loss of housing units to the city. Okay, and one, one more quick question. Um, the permit addresses uh, the units 201 through 207 yet part of the activity is in a first floor unit is that i'm going to assume that's allowed by right and therefore the permit does not affect that first floor unit the it's, office function that's in the first floor yeah there's an accessory office um that's just for storage and some admin work and it's in one of the suites downstairs and the applicant is the owner and the accessory um office is a lot by right. Thank you. Um, and I, I do, I see a number of hands raised and I do wanna reiterate our process right now that we've closed the public hearing. Uh, we won't be taking any more public comments uh, on this item tonight. Uh, we will have questions or we do, we will have questions I'm sure for the applicant who will respond, but that the public hearing portion is closed. And that um, when the um, commission asked those questions of both staff and the uh, applicant, uh, we will get more clarification. So just wanted to pass that on to everybody who maybe isn't aware of our processes. So um, other questions of staff. Um, I, I do have one. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that it's a local community center. Um, that 
le leads one to believe that the service is there just to serve that local community. Um, is there a definition or can you explain what the definition of local community center is and um, shed any light on that? Uh, sure, Cherise, so I can um, take a stab at that one. Um, so, you know, I think what is being referred to is um, the the definition of neighborhood shopping center, um, which is what is in our uh, general plan. When this site was zoned neighborhood commercial, um, it was back in, I believe it was 2000, it was either 2000, I think it was 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, uh, the city council made a finding at that time. So the underlying general plan land use designation is low density residential. Um, in order to um, approve the rezoning of the site to neighborhood commercial and approve the neighborhood uh, center that is there today, uh, the city council made a finding of general plan consistency um, that a neighborhood center is allowed in any of our land use districts, uh, in any of our, our general plan land use district, districts in the city. <clears throat> um, the definition of neighborhood shopping center in our general plan um, does identify that it is for um, providing shopping and services to satisfy the day-to-day -day needs of local neighborhoods and workplaces. Um, and and that is also where the um, discussion about um, neighborhood centers being allowed in all of our districts also lives. Uh, so I believe that that is what um, is being referred to um, by the community. Thank you. Um, any other questions for staff? Um, then uh, let's go ahead and um, do you have questions for the applicant? Any, uh, let's start with uh, Commissioner Cisco. So, and so, um, I'm sorry, have, so um, Commissioner Cisco, if you could ask the question and then uh, Mr. Wignall can respond and then we can we can do it that way, okay? Okay. okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Kind of what I thought. <laughs> no, but I instead of asking a, a, you know 10 questions and then he No, tried, no, no. I'd, I'd rather do it what you're suggesting. One. Thank you. Yeah, it's getting it. late. What can I say? <laughs> uh, no, I understand totally. Um yeah, Mr. Wagnall, um in could you illuminate me and us a little bit more um, in terms of detox I have a, an idea of what that actually means but what do you expect your patients to experience either in three to 14 days well typically the goal is for them to safely um, eliminate the drugs and alcohol from their system physically and be in a spot mentally where they're able to step down to the next level of care or return to their daily activities if that's what they're ready to do. Right, and that's where I'm, I think that's, and I wanna be respectful of how you have portrayed this, but um, I see detox as a very serious medical experience. And so just to say that you expect them to safely um, remove themselves from whatever substance they're using. It doesn't tell me what you expect to see of them physically and why their um, vitals are being taken every 15 minutes. Um, are they gonna be in bed? Um, what? Sure. I, I want a picture of what that, that detox uh, physically looks like on the premise. I think I, yeah, I think I understand what you're asking. Okay, good. Um, so I think it's important to distinguish that there are different levels of detox care that you can be licensed for with the Department of Health Care Services. We're, we're licensed for residential detox. The very serious inpatient detox happens at level 3.7 and level 4, which are inpatient detox. We're not an inpatient detox facility and we're not a medical facility. We are allowed to provide and licensed by the state to provide incidental medical services, which means that we're required to have a medical director who screens all of our applicants before they come in. That's the doctor with 25 years of experience that I mentioned. And he makes a decision based on his vast experience about whether the person is allowable in our level of care because they're under his, his care while they're with us. So he knows exactly what he can and can't treat in a non-medical facility. Um, so that can be someone who's detoxing from a number of different substances 
Um, typically, someone who's denied is someone who has extenuating health circumstances like um, a heart condition or diabetes or some other condition that would require placement in an inpatient facility like a hospital. Um, so we treat on the lower end of the spectrum of detox clients. While they're there, they do receive medications to help with their detox. Oftentimes, for the first day or so, they are in bed a lot. Um, and this is where the conversation about levels of care gets a little technical because what I'm describing sounds like we're a medical facility, and I understand that. There are specific carve-outs in the, the health and safety code for this reason that allow residential detox facilities to operate outside of the definition of a healthcare facility, which is also defined in the health and safety code. And I can point you to the specific sections of the code that describe that. But the Department of Healthcare Services recognized that there's a level of detox that can happen safely in a residential atmosphere that's not a medical facility. And a doctor is allowed to facilitate care there without it being considered a medical facility. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, that's what gets me to this, um, you know, the, the description of the uh, of your project says it's a monitored detox and withdrawal management facility staffed by medical assistants, supervised by a registered nurse and medical doctor. Um, and I guess the other question I would have is you're saying they do meet with a medical doctor initially who sets up a treatment plan to be administered by the day-to-day -day staff that it can include medications, I assume, to assist with the issues of detox, which are can be quite serious um, in terms of hallucinations, pain, um, agitation. Uh, so are you saying that this doctor could um, set up a treatment plan and give out um, or recommend medications for the treatment during detox? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> And so those, what medications those, might those be? Um, any medication that he feels is necessary for their detox at our level of care. However, what have you, this, what have, yeah, what have you seen those medications to be? Um, uh, benzodiazepines for alcohol withdrawal. Um, what is it? Gabapentin. Oh, yeah, gabapentin, um, phenobarbital. Um, I will say that our doctor is very conservative um, when it comes to medicating in our level of care, um, just based on his experience. And he's he's not afraid to deny clients into our facility that he's not comfortable with, um, because there are other facilities, uh, medical facilities that people can go to. Um, the, the other stipulation within incidental medical services, as described by the Department of Healthcare Services, is that medications are client self-administered, and we just monitor the administration of medications. So we're not... So, yeah, what does that exactly mean? Are you, you're handing them, because benzodiazepines are pretty addictive, and that could be an issue in a, in a treatment facility. So they're saying they're self-administered. I'm assuming they're not holding on to their own prescription, that someone's distributing that prescription as yes. described by the doctor. Uh, yes, they're, the clients take the medication as prescribed by the doctor, and our policies and procedures about handling medication are dictated by the Department of Healthcare Services. So they're triple locked. They're locked within the facility, locked behind a locked door in a locked cabinet. Clients go to that cabinet under supervision of the staff. Staff opens the cabinet, and all the clients' medications are in individual cubbies or little trays. The medications are handed to the client, counted in front of staff, um, ingested in front of staff, and then the medication is put back in the locking cabinet. And we do, under our IMS license, have the authority to count medications to make sure that no one is taking advantage of that. Okay, and then um, there's another uh, part of your project description that says uh, none of the patients are uh, bed bound or non ambulatory for the duration of their stay, but they could be bed bound for this detox period. Well, they have to be able to take their own medications, and we're not a nursing facility, so typically that's if that if that became the case for someone, they would be referred to a medical facility. 
So intention. you're expecting that somebody that's detoxing from an opioid would be ambulatory. They'd be up walking around during uh, yeah. the detox period? Well, they can rest and relax in their bed, um, but we are not a non-ambulatory facility. We don't have hospital beds. We don't, we don't move people around on gurneys. Um, yeah, I get people, that. Yeah, so if people can't, you know, take care of their own personal hygiene, um, and they can't get up to get their medications, they can't get up to have their vitals taken, they would be referred somewhere else. But the, the whole point of our in-depth pre-admission screen is to avoid those situations. Okay, and um, often with, with an opioid, there is um, a weaning period. Is that something that a medical doctor would uh, would um, suggest as treatment for somebody within your facility that they continue and wean themselves down from something like Percocet? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's up to his discretion, but I, I know that his philosophy is that um, a faster taper is better based on his experience. And so he does, we don't cut people off cold turkey because that's not safe, um, except with, I believe with, um, and so now you're you're asking me to answer policies and procedures that are written by the doctor and up hit, up to his discretion as a medical professional. So I'll do my best, um, but I know that I know from experience with this doctor that his philosophy is to taper people quickly and get them off addictive medications and onto medications that can help them with their withdrawal that are not narcotic natured. Okay. Does that all make sense? It does. Um, I'm, any other not, I'm not sure I agree that it's not a medical. <laughs> um, I, again, I can, I can point you to the, it, it has to do with ASAM criteria and level of care designation with the Department of Healthcare Services. Um, so I can, I can point you to those specific, you know, the criteria and the regulations um, and we are only we are only licensed to operate within our specific levels of care. So we can't take someone who needs inpatient detox. We make a referral for those things. Okay. I'm good. Are there other questions of the applicant at this time, uh, Commissioner Holton? So your average duration of stay for your clients is typically around. 15 to 30 days, something around that for a detox? Uh, detox is, no, 14 days is typically a, a decently long detox stay. Um, okay. So, it's, oh, go ahead. Part of that is determined by the insurance provider as well. Um, okay. They will only approve so much time up front, and then it's a matter of reporting back based on the client's affect and their status. And then there's the, like, the word negotiation sounds funny in this situation, but that's what it is. The insurance yeah. company is trying to get them out of a high level of care. And if yeah. they're not ready, we're trying to allow them to stay. So Exactly. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, what is your like current policy or what is your planned policy for um, family visitation or any kind of, you know, the, obviously they're not allowed to have their own vehicles and they're, not allowed to, you know, be leaving the site, but is there any plans on family visitation? And could you walk me through a little bit of your kind of in, like your uh, onboarding process on how you would bring a new client into that environment? Yeah, I can do both of those things. Great. Um, so um, as far as the, like for, in, for detox, um, Clients do not leave the facility while they're in detox. Um, yeah. our, our doctor might, when I mentioned light physical activity in my description, um, an example of that would be like um, when they're well enough and stable enough, go outside and walk up and down the deck to get some steps in um, so that people aren't, because the tendency when you're detoxing is to sit on the couch and watch TV, right? Um, that's comfortable. You're not feeling great. Um, so, but our doctor is a proponent of, of moving and and physically getting involved in your recovery in that way. Um, as far as um, the family, 
the family program, we don't allow any visitors while you're in detox. Um, and like I mentioned, people, we take clients' cell phones for three days when they get there because we don't want any communication other than supervised communication with staff on a house line. Um, it's just safer for everyone that way. Um, and then once, if someone is in the residential level of care after detox, we will have a family programming schedule. Typically treatment centers do those on Sundays because that's the best opportunity for families to come. And we would organize some sort of a family program, programming group. Um, I think a lot of times this would be a question for our program director because she's going to write the curriculum for that. Um, but it would involve some sort of combined um, activity for the clients and the parents or family members, and then also some sort of separate activity. Um, okay. And in the meantime, we have uh, we we donate our space um, at our outpatient facility for a friends and family group. That's a, a community peer support group for friends and family of people in addiction programs. Most of the people are, you know, friends and family of people in our program, but it is open to the community. Um, so they meet once a week in the evening at our facility once our programming is done. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are there other questions of the applicants? Um, I have uh, one, a couple probably. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Chair Weeks, just one oh. really, really quick one. Go ahead. Uh, there was a, a, a comment from the public, uh, a gentleman asking the question about your policy on failed drug tests. If there is more than one failed drug test, does that mean an immediate dismissal from your program or is or what is your policy? Thank you. Oh, sorry, Chair Weeks. That's okay. That's an important question too. Um, typically, if there's a relapse, there are multiple circumstances that apply to that situation. And our approach is always to meet the client where they're at and figure out what's going on. Um, sometimes the best thing to do, if it's two o'clock in the morning, we're probably not just going to tell someone that they have to walk out the front door and be gone, right? We're going to work on making a referral, contacting their family, um, we would isolate them so that they're not intoxicated in front of people who are trying to stay sober. Um, but we would treat indivi each individual situation as an individual. Um, and, and what would that isolation look like? I'm just really curious. Uh, I mean, not completely. We're not going to put them in a room by themselves, but they would be, we, we might move them to the, to one of the detox rooms if there's an extra space there to be under observation. Um, or they would be, you know, not in a bedroom with another client, maybe in a living room with a staff member, something like that. Until we can find out a safe plan for them to transition or make a referral to a different facility. So is that kind of your current policy at your current place? Or, I mean, I'm, I'm just, it seems like everything is kind of unwritten at this point. And, and not to, you know, I'm not questioning anything. I'm just curious if that's how you do things at your current facility. No, I can, I could pull up our our detox policy and procedure manual right now and and oh yeah no no I'm read, sure I'm just, read from read to you what it is. I'm not the manager. I know this is a new facility. kind of, you know, this is a pretty big step. I, I mean, this is definitely going from a six bed transition to a, you know, as the public had commented, it is a pretty dramatic you know increase in number of beds that you're requesting and. I'm just trying to understand if everything has really been thought through. Well, I would say in, in that vein, I would say that um, while it's true that we don't have 24 beds now, before we can operate a single bed above six, we have to go through the licensing and accreditation process again with the state. So whatever answers I don't have will be answered before we can operate at this facility. And the Department of Health Care Services is the sole authority in the state of California that can regulate our industry. So we have to answer to them and they hold us accountable. Um, so you're right, I haven't written a policy and procedure handbook for an entire 24 bed facility yet, but it's something that we have to do. And there are multiple accrediting and governing bodies that hold us accountable to the highest standard when we do that. Totally understandable. I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um so a couple of the um, the public comments talked about um, surveillance and monitoring. And 
Are you going to have cameras around to make sure people are where they should be? Um, it was a, there was that discussion around um, that or whether, and my assumption from what you've said is that it's not a lock, a locked up facility or is it? Because that no, was also a question no. that the public. No, everyone who comes to our facility chooses to be here. And if they want to leave, they can. Um, with that said, we take steps to make sure that because, you know, for multiple reasons, it's the best thing to do for the client. We're required by the state to keep an eye on people. Um, so to short answer to your question is yes, we're going to change a few things with the facility to make sure that our staff has the tools they need to do their jobs. Um, including, it sounds like most of you have been to the building and have a decent idea of what the layout is. Um, if you're looking at the front of the building that we bought, there are two sta staircases, one on each side that go up to the second floor where we want to do this in an elevator. Both of those staircases are behind a gate that's locked after business hours, and only residents and employees have access to that gate. The elevator also is locked after business hours. Um, and there's a keypad to use the elevator. Um, our plan is to, once you get upstairs, there's a shared deck that then veers to the left towards our, our building. And there's a long deck that connects all seven apartments upstairs. Um, we are going to add a gate on both sides. That's another layer of locking from the outside with an emergency push bar on the inside. So in the event of an emergency, it's not an evacuation hazard but only our staff will have access into those gates from the outside. Um, potentially it's either gonna be a combination or an RFID gate where our staff will have, our staff wear badges to identify themselves. And that will be a, a keypad to unlock the gate that gets into the residential, um, residential units back there. And then we probably will also have cameras on both ends of the deck because those will be the only two points of access to our facility. We also have cameras in our detox facility that monitor the, the IMS room where medications are taken um, and the, the common area towards the front door as well. So we know who's come in and out of the, the facility. Thank you. Um, so are there other questions of the applicant or staff? Uh, did I miss other questions from the public? Uh, Commissioner Carter? I, I think there was a, a question from the public about the process going forward. You might touch on what happens after we make our decision. Thank you. Um, so what happens, and please weigh in both staff and commission if I um, miss a step. Uh, once we act tonight, whether it be in support or not in support, um, there's an appeal process that um, the applicant or the neighbors can appeal whatever our decision is to the city council. And then the city council would weigh in it in on this item um, and they are the final authority. Um, is that, does that cover it you think or? Is that? Yes, that's, okay. that's, that's correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss out on a step. Um, if I could just quickly clarify, Chair Weeks, um, so the appeal period, just so everybody is aware, um, both the applicant and uh, the community, uh, the appeal period is 10 calendar days from the date of the decision. And so if that 10th day falls on a day that the city is not closed, so for example, on a weekend, um, then the 10 days falls to forward to the next uh, uh, business day that the city is open. Uh, so if I'm counting correctly on our calendar, uh, the appeal, the final day to appeal any decision made by the planning commission tonight would be uh, Monday, December 19th. Thank you. Um, so uh, Commissioner Carter. Yes, one other. Uh, the applicant mentioned that he, I, I believe I, if I understood correctly, still needs certification from the state. It might be helpful for him if he can discuss that process and how that uh, 
goes in a, in a high level that is relevant to our discussion here. Sure. Yes, that would be great. And, and also when you talk about that, is the certification the same as the license agreement that we talked about earlier, or, or are they two different things? They're two different things. So right now we are certified to um, provide outpatient and day treatment. So the Department of Healthcare Services has two levels of credentialing that you can apply for when it comes to alcohol and drug facilities. You can certify a program where people aren't living um, and it certifies your curriculum, your staffing requirements, the safety of the building for day traffic, but not overnight traffic. And then you can license a residential facility and your program. So a license uh, applies to the, the building that we're occupying as well as the program that we're providing there, whereas a certification only applies to the program. And then there's some minor safety concerns that are addressed with that as well. Um, and in both cases, we also are accredited by the Joint Commission, which is the highest level of accreditation you can get in our field for providing the services we do. So um, we currently have an application in with the Department of Healthcare Services to add the six beds that, the, that were allowed by right at this new facility. Um, and once that application is finished, there's the whole nother app. We have to submit a completely different application to add more beds to that location pending approval, pending this permit from the city, because the state won't grant us additional beds without approval from the city. Does that make sense? It's an entire another application. And also, you know, all the like the questions that um, I'm sorry, I can't see your name right now. Commissioner Holton had um, will need full policies and procedures for every service that we plan to offer. The staffing plan has to be in place. Um, they come out and do a site visit before they grant our our license. Um, so we're expecting a site visit soon for the, the six bed facility. Um, and then they'll come out again and they'll they'll inspect those six beds as well as the beds that we add. Um, and then once we have that license, we have, I believe it's 30 or 90 days to let the joint commission know, and then they'll come do another site visit for our accreditation as well. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Carter? Okay. Um, there was one more question um, and it had to do with the smoking. Um, I know that if, um, if this is approved, that I believe the um, construction of any kind of smoking kiosk would have to go to design review board. Yeah. Um, and has there been some thought about um, the fact that that is on a scenic highway? I believe Highway 12 is a scenic road. And correct me if I'm wrong, staff. Um, and then necessity uh, for you to have that type of a smoking facility. I don't know, that probably didn't make any sense, did it? No, it, it did. Okay. Um, I have talked to, to Nora about that, and I'm aware of the additional requirements for a scenic, I forget the exact term, but um, being a scenic route, there are certain design components that need to be considered whenever you're building something that can be seen from that road. And so we're we're completely open to, to working with the city on whatever is best for um, a location and a design for that that structure um the the space that that i suggested on our plan was just based on me looking at the smoking ordinance and finding a spot that kind of fit in with the setbacks but i think there are several other options that could work that that may even be you know less obtrusive um farther away from the sidewalk things like that so um and the scenic road combining district, the accessory structure setback um, would be the same as the primary zoning district if it's for like say a gazebo or an uncovered um, structure. So uh, that is why I mentioned that the applicant plans to work with the city to find the most appropriate design um, and location. And would you anticipate, going back to my previous question, would you anticipate having cameras and monitoring on that site to ensure that um, 
that uh, the number of people there is consistent with what's in um, the policy? Probably not since it's a public area, but one of the conditions that was recommended by staff was that um, we have no more than five people in the smoking area at once, and that includes a staff member um, because we would always have a staff member with clients while they're out there. Uh, and we're, we're okay with that condition. Okay. Good. Okay, so any other questions before I ask somebody to uh, read the resolution and we can start with comments? Okay, would somebody like to enter this? We have one resolution. Uh, would somebody like to enter that? Uh, Vice Chair Peterson. Uh, so I'll move the resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa, making findings and determinations and approving a minor conditional use permit for Pura Vida Recovery Services, a 24 bed community care facility, and voiding the previously issued zoning clearance issued on July 22nd, 2022, for a community care facility with six or fewer clients, file number ZC. 22-0202 located at 5761 Mountain Hawk Drive, Santa Rosa, Suites 201-207, APN 153-180-029, file number CUP 22-045 and waive for the reading. Thank you. And is there a second? Commissioner Carter, second. Thank you. So with that, um, let's, we'll mix this up and I'll start with uh, comments for, excuse me, from uh, Commissioner Cisco. Well, we heard, we heard a lot tonight um, from the public and uh, you know, every meeting and uh, Chair Weeks did at this meeting describes for the public what our purview and our process, uh, our purpose is, uh, which is to um, compare projects to our land use policies and zoning code. So um, some of the comments that the public made uh, clearly don't fit in there. Um, and I think uh, Vice Chair uh, Peterson uh, clarified some of those that we don't look at property values. There isn't a setback established for community care centers from schools. Um, there can be mitigation factors for uh, large facilities that are uh, considered over concentration. So, um, what I'm going to be doing is speaking just strictly to our zoning code. And uh, the zoning code um, definition of a community care facility says a facility, place, or building that is maintained and operated to provide non-medical residential care. And I hear the applicant, and again, I wanna be respectful of their interpretation of what that means, um, but I don't agree with that interpretation. And it's our job tonight to interpret our own zoning code. Um, so I look at non-medical residential care and I think about detox and I think about what I know that to be is a medical uh, situation. I think the applicant uh, did describe some of those issues um, that can involve um, delusions. It can involve seizures. It can involve um, vomiting. It can involve aggression and agitated behavior. And I hear that a medical doctor is going to evaluate somebody and develop a treatment plan that would be administered by staff, which would include medications, which I consider a medical treatment. Um, they're saying they're self-administered, but basically staff is giving them their medication and watching them take it. Uh, they're taking vitals um, every 15 minutes because there's a potential more serious medical issue um, if they don't have that medication and aren't, aren't, and aren't detoxing safely and properly. So for me, um, 
the fatal flaw for this project is that it does not fit our definition of a community care facility uh, to be uh, to be providing non-medical residential care. Um, I can't get past that, uh, and I, I would not be able to make the findings uh, that that would support this, uh, given my interpretation of what that means and what I see in the project description of this applicant. Um, that being said, um, I think it is an awkward site, very difficult to supervise. Um, the, the seven separate apartments, there is a lot of transportation of, of these uh, clients or patients, whatever you want to call them. I would call them patients, <laughs> but um, and, you know, and I hear I hear the public's concern about safety and and all of these things. Um, some speaking to, and the applicant spoke to, you know, the stigma, of not wanting uh, individuals dealing with um, alcohol or drug treatment to be stigmatized, isolated, um, or uh, you know, s separated from the community. But there's another issue there for individuals going through this kind of treatment, and that's privacy. And one of the things that I don't like about this particular setting and this particular operational um, definition of taking them off site and bringing them back is that, um, and these aren't gonna be derelict people. I mean, there are they're very well-educated, professional individuals, uh, high economic, uh, socioeconomic status that are struggling and, and need treatment. And I look at this and I go, where's the protection of their anonymity or their privacy or their confidentiality if they're being walked down <laughs> or if they're going to be smoking or doing whatever very in a very, very public place. So I have concerns about that. Again, um, I'm relying on our zoning code right here, uh, but I'm just gonna make these observations that I find troubling about the site itself. Um, the smoking uh, enclosure on a scenic road appalls me. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just appalls me that we would even think of that. Um, and I don't like, uh, I don't like uh, approving things and conditions which really are enforceable. And I see that condition um, as unenforceable. And I, I believe it was set forth to sort of mitigate the idea that it's it's in close proximity to the other um, uh, facility. But um, basically for me, the fatal flaw is that this project does not meet um, our zoning code description of a community care center and should not be uh, allowed um, in this particular area, and I'll be voting against the project. Thank you. Uh, let's go uh, now to uh, Vice Chair Peterson for some comments. Uh, sure, thank you, Chair Weeks. Um, well, I, I think uh, Commissioner Cisco pretty ably put out what we're here to look at. Um, and I think as we see with with these in a lot of different cases, land use is a proxy for much larger, uh, more complicated kind of policy decisions. So I think part of what's getting built into this is how does the city of Santa Rosa deal with the problem of addiction? Where should, you know, people who are trying to get clean uh, be able to find that space? Um, I think we heard some stereotypes about addicts uh, that I think were unfortunate um, and I, I don't agree with, but um, that's not really what we're dealing with. Um, as Commissioner Sisko said, what we're looking at is, is land use and, and the findings we have to make for this particular use permit. Um, and uh, unlike Commissioner Cisco, the, the one I'm struggling with um, is the zoning district compliance. Um, I understand the zoning code's position and the general plans, uh, you know, setting up community care facilities are allowed in every zoning district except for motor vehicle uh, 
services, whatever that one is. Uh, and it makes sense. It's, it's the same thing for, for cannabis. We want these to be uh, dispersed throughout the city. We don't want to unfairly burden uh, any one neighborhood. These people who are there are part of the community and deserve to be integrated into it. Um, So it, why is Skyhawk any different? You know, why, you know, should Roseland have to bear this? Should, you know, some other neighborhood have to bear this? Um, but what I, what I struggle with is the definition of the neighborhood commercial zoning and the uses of the center are intended to provide for the day-to-day -day needs of local neighborhoods and workplaces, uh, but not to be of such a scope and variety as to attract substantial traffic volumes from outside the neighborhood. So I'm interested to hear from my fellow commissioners on, on that point, um, because to me, while it is allowable, it does seem to be at odds with the purpose of the commercial uh, or neighborhood commercial zoning district. Um, again, it's, it's a strange situation. I think we find ourselves in where a six bed or fewer would be by right. You know, the applicant could open that six bed up, doesn't come to us. There's no public input, um, but you know, seven or more comes to us and this is where we find ourselves. So I think that tension is what, what I'm struggling with, which is giving purpose to that, you know, if we're gonna have a zoning code, neighborhood commercial has a purpose, but community care is allowed in all the zoning districts. So um, like I said, I'm, I'm interested to hear from my fellow commissioners on that. That's that's the finding that I'm struggling with um, at this point. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Commissioner Carter. Uh, well, first of all, I wanna thank the applicant and the members of the community that have uh, given us a thorough presentation today and uh, airing of thoughts about the project. And thank you all for taking the time to do that. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Cisco did a wonderful job of, of sort of parsing out what a community care facility is and how a, uh, a recovery facility fits into that. I'm not medically versed, but I, I would like to believe that a community care facility includes recovery facilities. And I think had the applicant uh, well, the applicant got a clearance to, to do his by right community care on this site. But the reason it comes to us as a use permit is because um, we need to exercise some discretion in the, in the locating of these larger community care facilities. And I think Commissioner Cisco's uh, pointing out the awkwardness of the site um, also illustrates that there are some uh, conditions that would make a community care facility unacceptable in a residential area. And I think, you know, I really came into this thinking this was just a, a NIMBY situation, but I think there really are difficulties with this site that makes it difficult for me to make the land use findings that they are, that is appropriate for a, a community care facility of this size in a setting like this. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Holton. So uh, first off, I'd just like to thank all the staff, all of the fellow, all my fellow commissioners, especially you Chair Weeks for continuously reiterating that keep the comments concise, keep them from being the same thing over and over again. I swear we had, it was like there was five callers. I wanna really actually recognize the commenter bill for being the first guy to actually just be exactly that i agree with everyone else but this isn't about that this is totally about the zoning and this is really i'm having the same difficulty as all of my other fellow commissioners in terms of finding the finding the way to see this as the, the community center engagement component of it is just really really difficult to kind of grasp and I, I just think that really at this point it's it is an awkward location um, I, I think that there's got to be better 
locations in the closer proximity that you probably even get for better commercial real estate value. <laughs> um, but that's not, that's here nor there. Uh, for brevity's sake, I'll just say uh, I can't really make the findings to support this project right now. Um, but that's, that's just pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also am having a hard time making the findings tonight. Um, both the issue of is it medical, is it not medical, as well as the whole issue around uh, the neighborhood commercial uh, zoning. Um, and so I will not be supporting the project. Uh, I, I do want to, though, kind of piggyback on what Vice Chair Peterson mentioned about kind of the some of the comments we heard stigmatizing people um, who have addiction issues and some of the fear-based comments we heard to me are always very unsettling. Um, um, but nevertheless, uh, I, like I said, I, I will not be supporting this project uh, tonight as I feel I can't make the findings. So with that, um, go ahead, Ms. Jones. Uh, yes, so um, uh, since it appears that the Planning Commission is moving towards uh, denial for this project, just wanted to note that the resolution that is before you is for approval. Um, and so uh, at this point, there is no resolution for denial before the commission. So uh, we would need to have direction from the Planning Commission uh, to uh, go back and prepare a resolution of denial based on uh, the comments made by the Planning Commission at tonight's meeting uh, and return at the next available Planning Commission meeting, uh, which at this point would likely be uh, uh, the first meeting in January um, uh, and uh, bring forward uh, the resolution again based on uh, the comments made tonight by the Commission. I don't, know, that if, uh, I don't know if our attorney has anything additional to add to that. Um, would that come to us as a consent item? I believe that it would. Okay. Um, I don't think it would. I think it come as a regular item. So, Ms. Crocker, can you help us? I guess it would. I, I think we can figure that out, but my inclination would be that that would just be a consent item to reflect the direction given this evening by the commission. Oh, got it. To identify uh, which finding it is that you are unable to make. Perhaps uh, I think I, I've got the gist from the notes here, but maybe um, if you can put a little bit more um, meat on on the skeleton of what you guys were saying there would be helpful. So um, some of you were talking about the consistency with the zoning code, so that would be one of the findings. Um, some were more about the design location or physical suitability uh, of the site. And then just in addition that um, it doesn't meet the very definition of the community care facility due mm -hmm. to medical nature. Okay. So um, do you have what you need or do you want us to delve a little deeper? I, I will just, uh, defer to staff. Do you feel like you have what you need? I have taken pretty good notes, but if you'd like to um, have Chair Weeks call on each commissioner um, to give their opinion of what, you know, to state their findings that they're having the most trouble with um, that could add some more clarity prior to the vote. I think we have what we need. Okay. Okay. So um, since a motion was made, do we rescind that motion? No, there's a motion on the table and you will vote yes or no. Okay, got it. Okay, so with that. We need, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, so with that, if staff has what they need from us for tonight, um, we could go ahead and, and vote on this. It was um, moved by uh, Vice Chair Peterson and seconded by Commissioner Carter. Commissioner Carter? No. 
Commissioner Sisko? No. Commissioner Holton? No. Vice Chair Peterson? No. Chair Weeks? No. So that motion failed um, with five ayes and Commissioner Duggan and Okrepke being um, absent. And so with that, I do want to note that this action, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Crocker, but that the action is final unless an appeal is filed within 10 calendar days of today's action. The time limit will extend to the following business day if the last day falls on a day that the city is closed pursuant to zoning code section 20-62.030. For further information on how to submit an appeal form, please contact your project planner. So I think um, that is it for tonight. Unless anybody has anything else they'd like to uh, mention and uh, we all adjourn this to our next uh, meeting of the Planning Commission, which I believe we have a special meeting next week. So we'll, we'll see you all uh, next week. Thank you very much, everybody.